Hey, it's Jim Bradley. I am Marjorie Egan. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live at the Boston Public Library to do every Friday and now every Tuesday and Wednesday as well. And we are streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News and facebook.com slash GBH News. Programming note, Jim. Yes. Next Tuesday, we're going to be back here at the library. We're here every Tuesday with an hour of Ask the Mayor with Boston Mayor Michelle Wu, who's going to take our questions and yours. And... We change our clocks this weekend, Jim. We do? Yes. Well, uh, it's interesting you say that. So tune in Monday for the moldiest of chestnuts. We will have our <laughs> annual debate. Well, actually, it's our biannual debate about daylight saving time. I have two more things to say before we start. Uh -huh. One, we have some incredibly beautiful, inspirational, and timely music coming in about 30 minutes. We do. It's from great. White Snake Project. So stick around for that. What's the other thing I wanted to say? Oh, and by the way, I don't know if people in the audience know this. You're actually allowed to applaud when Marjorie says, welcome to Boston oh, Public Radio. There we go. That's right. Thank you. Thank that you is... very much. Nothing like having to beg for applause. Not only beg, say. but it was pathetic <laughs> after we begged. Let's try it one more time. Welcome to Boston Public Radio. Still very weak, but thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. So it appears that Joe Biden is back. Last night, half the nation let out a monstrous sigh of relief around 10.30 p.m. as President Biden wrapped up an energized State of the Union address without any of the disastrous senior moments that Marjorie or Chuck Todd were so worried about yesterday. The President, as I hope you heard, emphasized support for Ukraine, touted huge economic gains he's managed to deliver in the aftermath of COVID, announced new commitments to humanitarian relief in Gaza, clashed with that lunatic Marjorie Taylor Greene, called out conservatives who were reneging on that immigration deal, contrasted himself with his predecessor, as he referred to repeatedly, and at one point addressed directly, I love this, with the six members of the Supreme Court sitting right in front of him, the repeal of Roe v. Wade. And he faced head on his age, Congressman Jerry Nadler, did you hear this, Marjorie? After the speech, the guy from New York City joked to Biden after it was over, nobody's going to talk about cognitively impaired Joe now. So we want to know what you made of it. We hope you watched and what you think it may mean for the months ahead in this election. The call or text, the number is 877-301-8970. What was your impression of last night? Well, I, you know, I think uh, Peggy Noonan, who was the great speechwriter for Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. she's a Republican, she writes for the Wall Street Journal, uh, her piece about, uh, I think, nailed it. He, she talked about it. it was pow, pow, pow from the moment he came out. Uh, he went from Ukraine, which is very embarrassing, I would think, to a lot of Republicans, how they've abandoned uh, Ukraine in their hour of need, and then to abortion. Uh, he, he, it was a lot of, it was much less boring than the typical State of the Union address. I mean, everybody talked about Barack Obama as being a great orator. Well, his State of the Union's addresses were boring. And these laundry lists is what we always have. As many people have said, this is like a campaign speech. And he delivered it with a lot of passion. He and did. I thought his back and forth uh, with the audience, you know, uh, when Republicans were booing him, it, it was it was good. It was he's he's good at that impromptu ad lib, which I think a lot of people uh, claim who don't like Joe Biden that he's uh, that he's uh, g incapable of. And I think the bottom line here is that we have to keep in mind is that Joe Biden is not a rapist, a tax fraud, a, a traitorous uh, insurrectionist, uh, and a guy who's mentally deranged, which is Donald Trump. Well, let me tell you, I, I, I want, he's still 81. Uh, I have he's to say, and you, when you see it, I think you know he is, but he was a vigorous and energized 81. Uh, and let me put it this way, it's probably more significant. I went to sleep before he did last <laughs> night, so I think that's well, of some significance. He referred to his predecessor, I'm sure you all know this, never Trump by name, 12 or 13 times. Here's just a few references he made to, uh, again, his predecessor. A former Republican president tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. A president, my predecessor, failed the most basic presidential duty 
that he owes to American people, the duty to care. I love that, the duty to uh, yeah, care. You know, and by the way, as you said, you know, ordinarily these speeches start really slowly. I'm here to tell you, I'll talk about the State of the Union, and the State of the Union is good. He saved that for the beginning. Strong. He That's exploded out of the box, yep. as you said, with that Ukraine thing, and that contemptuous line from the odious Donald Trump uh, uh, about uh, let Putin do whatever the hell he wants. And I can't remember a speech, a, a State of the Union speech, that began with that sort of uh, ferocity, no, he went, which I thought was really it terrific. Was, it was Ukraine, and then he went to January 6th, and he talked about uh, the, the Republicans spreading that lie over and over again, the group. then he went to uh, in vitro fertilization, right, to abortion. And this, I particularly liked uh, his calling out the Supreme Court right in front of them for overturning Roe v. Wade. We have a clip of um, the president doing that. Women power is the clip. Clearly, those bragging about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. I thought it was great facing them down, sitting in the front row. And the liberals were there as well as the conservatives. Alito was not there. Do you know what I heard uh, on CNN? I don't know why. Or Clarence. Uh, Clarence Thomas has not come since 2006. Yeah, yeah I was surprised I don't know by what that. And who was the third missing one? Amy uh, Coney Barrett. Amy Coney Barrett, yeah, right, exactly. So either. the other six were there. So, Marjorie, I, I have one more thing to say what before, would that, what would that be, we, uh, before we take calls. What would mm-hmm. you say? What would that be? I would like to say... We see you. We hear you. Jim. We stand by you. Okay. We see you. We hear you. And we stand with you. What's the matter with that woman? This is Katie Britt, (laughs) who neither of us knew was a senator from Alabama until she said, we see you. Oh, God. It was like the exorcist or the handmaid's tale or whatever kind of thing. It was really bad. We stand by you kind of thing. (laughs) And uh, uh, you know know what's interesting about this, which shows that we're in a bubble, too? Mm -hmm. Virtually every commentator, including uh, sane Republican commentators, thought her presentation was an unmitigated disaster. And then I read Tom Nichols, who we both have great respect yeah. for, from The Atlantic. And he said the same things. It was horrible. It was, you know, just uh, like a high school thing. And he said, but her base and Trump's base, I'm paraphrasing, are going to totally love it. And it's probably true, don't you think? I mean, it's probably, what are you making a face for? Because I, I, I don't, I mean, they might like the thing she said, but the whole thing was totally bizarre. You mean unlike Donald well, Trump was never totally bizarre? You know, it's that Griffin woman that used to work for Donald Trump was all over CNN. Alyssa out. Griffin, I think it's Alyssa What was Griffin. the message? Uh, we have her in the kitchen? Yeah. Uh, I mean, is this where she should be in the kitchen? I She's tell, a, she I know, Senator, I know right? what the message was. What was the message? We see. Eight seven seven three zero one eighty nine seventy is the number. The one problem I have, I have to say, and I don't know enough about foreign policy, yeah. humanitarian aid. This floating port thing, which obviously is huge, uh, uh, which is going to be established by the United States. No troop boots on the ground, but obviously tens of thousands of troops to set this up. Maybe it's the most that can be done, particularly since it seems like the temporary ceasefire talks are falling apart, at least from what I read when I woke up this morning. I also read in the New York Times it's going to take 30 to 60 days yeah. to have this they humanitarian, this floating port available, it's floating not, pier, I'm not sorry. good enough. And there are going to be a lot of starved, dead uh, people in uh, Gaza by then, particularly if the ceasefire, at least the temporary ceasefire, doesn't happen. In any case, he, want to know what your thing, reaction? Let me just say your reaction to last night. Both obviously our primary concern is what you thought of Joe Biden's performance and what he had to say. But if you want to talk about Katie Britt, we'd love to talk about her. Well, too. there's also Marjorie uh, Taylor Greene, and to quote again Peggy Noonan, again Reagan speech speech writer, mm-hmm. brilliant uh, writer. I uh, said Marjorie Taylor Greene with her hat, which is not allowed in those chambers, but I guess they allowed her to wear it anywhere. Her MAGA hat. Her yeah. MAGA hat on it and some crazy t-shirt she had on and a red outfit uh, and screaming at the president. As Peggy Noonan, again, a Republican speechwriter for Ronald Reagan, said she made her party look stupid and her movement look vulgar. And she did. If, if You know, to most people, there's a visceral reaction to somebody in this lunatic Outfit but you're screaming. making the same mistake I think you made on Katie Britt to, to channel Tom Nichols. Trump is vulgar. And they love Trump. She, yeah, but Marjorie I Taylor Greene Jim, is a small-time version of Donald it, Trump. I don't think it transfers. I, I what, do. what he says in somebody else's mouth, I don't think necessarily works. 
Well, we'll see how much they love her. Eight, seven, by the way, happy International Women's Day. Isn't it? It's today, right? Thank you very it is. much. You're very welcome. And I, but I have to point out to Katie Britt, uh, Thank you. Uh, Ms. Um, Pro Life, with a big, huge cross around her neck. And mm. by the way, if you're wearing a big, huge cross I around know, your this neck, you, nuts. you probably shouldn't lie as much as she did last night. Because I'm not sure that's the Christ like thing to do. Uh, but, but a lot of these Republican women have these big crosses. I'm not sure Laura what exactly know, their message is. Too. But in any case, she's got to make her mind. She can't believe life begins at conception and be pro-IVF. She's got to be one or the other. And, and she all says these she's other, both, right. And all these other Republicans yeah, yeah, that yeah. say life believes at conception. Well, if that's right, you got to be you got to be banning IVF. You can't have it both ways. Okay, before we get to the calls, can I just say one more quick thing to you that I haven't mentioned? What? We see you. <laughs> Jim, we hear can I, can you. Can I ask you a favor? Can I ask you a favor? We stand by you. Can what? I ask you a favor? What? I can't. I can't hear you saying this anymore. <laughs> let's play. Let's have Katie say. Okay, it. here's Katie Britt. Uh, excuse me, Senator Katie Britt, telling us that she sees us and hears us and stands by us. We see you. We <laughs> hear you, and we stand. With you. By the way, that's an SNL version you know, of her actually do it. It is the real thing, but she, oh my God. She's not running for president, so I don't think you dump, dump all over her too much. Yeah, he wants to She's be, a front runner for, for VP. Vice, for vice president. The other thing is, you can't get up there with a cross around your neck, big, wonderful, uh, upstanding person, and tell us that sexual assault is the worst thing that can happen to a woman while you're urging everybody to vote for a guy who's been found civilly guilty That of is brilliant, rape. Marjorie. Amen. Well, 877-301-8970. You want to know what you thought of uh, the president last night, and obviously to a far lesser degree the, uh, the Republican response, which I don't think that many people actually watch. You know, Jamie, can you check? I assume it's available now. I should have asked this before. If, if there's any release on how many people actually watched last night, ordinarily a State of the Union gets 20 plus million viewers, and I'm curious if the numbers were higher since it's an election year. Let's start on the case with Frank. Frank, welcome to the show. Hi. Good morning. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, Katie. Hi. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Katie Britt was unwatchable, but I'll, I won't get into that. Well, you did. But I thought Joe did a good job. I thought Biden did a real good job. Um, but my problem is that he uses the pronoun I too much when he's taking credit for all these accomplishments. I didn't notice yeah. that. I usually don't like that either. I didn't know that he did, and if he did, I'm with you. Uh, like every time. Well, he talked about, I did, I'm did. i doing all this heavy work in Gaza, trying to get relief to Gaza, and then they cut to Blinken, who's doing all the work. And, you know, it's an administration. Well, I, 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 I don't, by team. the way, I don't, the, Frank, you lost me on that one. I don't like the use of the word I, but to suggest that Joe Biden is not attempting to put pressure on Netanyahu, I think is not actually accurate but frank thank you for your call we appreciate it 877-301-8970 is the uh, number i thought he also did a brilliant job i know everybody knew this was coming is putting the republicans on the defensive about the uh the deal uh last night and by the way you know katie Britt was one of the people the senator from alabama was one of the people who worked on the compromise deal and then voted against the compromise deal. For right, that's and worth. she went on and on about how concerned she was about the border, and, of course, she voted, if she were really concerned about the border, the wrong way. Yeah, on but, the deal she negotiated right. with Langford from Oklahoma. That's right, so she's not really concerned about the border. Where are we going? Gail in Duxbury, thank you for calling. Hi, Gail. Hi, thank you for taking my call. I love your show. Thanks. Um, yeah, so the State of the Union, to me, the biggest point was when that Senator Lankford oh, yeah. mouthed, you're right. That said it all to me about the Republican you know, Party, and they are now totally Trump party. Wait a second, you know, Gail, I, I was actually listening, not watching at that moment. Yeah. Did he do that? You saw it. He did? He yes. He mouthed it. Yes. That is he huge. It. He was the chief right. negotiator on the bipartisan deal that fell apart on immigration. I didn't. That is fabulous, Gail. I'm really glad yeah, you pointed you that to, out. You have to watch it again. Thanks. Yeah. I will. Thank you. Unbelievable. And by the way, for those who don't know, Langford is about as conservative uh, as a Republican can get in the United States Senate. But he led the effort to strike this bipartisan deal. You know, where, where are we standing in terms of debates? Has Trump Well, indicated? actually, yesterday I saw on CNN, uh, I was under the impression, maybe wrongly, but you never know if Trump means what he says, that they were not going to happen. Trump has said the presidential commission 
whatever it's called, the commission on presidential debates, they don't like them because they don't like the moderators. It's rigged. The conventional wisdom is that Biden wouldn't want to be in a debate with him. However, all over CNN yesterday, again, you don't know if this is BS or not, was Trump saying, I'll debate him anywhere, anytime. So there's no formal status, uh, just the rhetoric so we don't know. of Donald Trump yesterday. Because several people are uh, texting and saying they want to see a debate. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's going to happen. Anyway, 877-301-8970 is the number. Sean from Holden, thank you for calling. Hello, Sean. Hi, Sean. Hi. Um, Hi. It, well, it was Groveland. Um, oh, Groveland, sorry. we're sorry. You, no, yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, always great to talk to, with the two of you. Thank um, you. So what I wanted to... Um, so I first I'll just say I, I think when Biden said... Um, that there was that portion of the speech talking about abortion and the power of women. I thought that was pretty um, well done. And then there was also the, um, the um, I, I keep trying to remember, um, I, I can't remember, but I, I, I think, um, I, I also feel the same way about the, his age and just like the general idea of it. But I, um, obviously I'm not going to vote for Trump. So I think that's, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, and um, but By the way, Sean, the, Sean, did he allay? Of, did he allay any of your concern? I mean, I'm someone who's concerned about his age. I felt a lot better about it after whatever it was 70 think, minutes of him last night. I, I think he made a good point about he's been called too young in the past, and that like you know he knows he's he's been around the block a few times basically. And then I think, but what I really wanted to point out was Katie Britt and like. I think I agree with Marjorie with what Marjorie said. Um, did you say it, it was bizarre? Is that what you said? Um, I, it, the, the whole lineup. Kind of yeah, they're not. I've never seen a a, a man give a speech, uh, the rebuttal to the president's speech in his kitchen. I mean, well, I was trying. What to, was the message? Yeah. The message um, was I'm we're just a typical dinner. family sitting by. Well, you know, fathers are in a typical family. I, mean, I didn't think it worked, but I, yeah, I understood I, the point. But go ahead, Sean. I'm sorry. I think Katie Britt also just sounds. I think Katie Britt also just sounded a little like, um, like her speech just didn't have much to it. Like it was like even if even if I was, you know, rooting for a Republican yeah. candidate, I, I I'm kind of like you know what is she what, like. What so is so like, Sean, what is to be clear, to you didn't feel that. She heard you and saw you. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't stop. stop Sean, it. thank you for the. I didn't do it, by the way. She did it. I'm just doing her as yeah. best I can. Okay, I think we should. Stick I didn't with, pick I her. think we should stick with the real thing, Jim. We'll I'm sorry. You. I don't mean to we hurt your feelings you. there. I heard you. Okay, let's go to Terry in Hingham. Thank you Hi, for Terry. calling, Terry. Hello. How are you? Fine. Good. Thank you. Good. Uh, I just had two comments about the uh, speech last night. First of all, I do wonder how Mike Johnson will look back at this as he becomes older and he realizes that he sat behind one of the greatest statesmen of our country to make one of the best speeches ever made. Yeah. And he won't be rolling his eyes, I'm sure, when he's 50 or 60 years well, old. Well, you know, speaking of Mike Johnson, I meant to say, Terry, before you continue, I, you always watch what the speaker, if he or she is from the, the different party. We all remember Nancy Pelosi ripping up Trump's speech page by page. Yeah, that's true. But uh, the Mike Johnson thing, because he hadn't done this before. Did you notice, yeah. I talked to Marjorie about this, the first part of uh, Biden's speech was about Ukraine. And Johnson yes. is blocking clap. a vote. Yeah. He didn't clap. He kept nodding yeah. in agreement. Yeah. I think forgetting who he, oh, he did yeah. clap? I thought, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. That's even better. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. but you know what he's, the other thing, he's Terry? He's the guy holding up the I just said, the yeah, aid. he's the guy that's not he's allowing a vote. Yeah. But by the way, you know the other thing right. that drives me nuts, Terry, forget the speaker, is the fact uh. that the opposition party, whether it's Democrats with a Republican president or Republicans like last night with a Democratic president, can never stand to show respect yeah. for the president of the United yeah. States. Uh, it's just, it's yeah. so... Well, it's pretty uh, disheartening. It is. Yeah. So I interrupted you. you have another uh, thought? No, I just have one other thought. Sure. As I looked at Marjorie Taylor Greene, all I could think of was, why is she wearing her dunk cap? <laughs> -dum -dum. Thank you very much, Terry. We appreciate yeah, your call. Yeah, I mean, talk about a woman with no 
class. I mean, just just zero. It's kind of depressing. Anyway, uh, anyway, uh, we are talking about the president's speech last night. What you thought about it? Uh, you can weigh in on Katie Britt as well. Of course, she is not uh, running for any national office at the moment. Yeah, too. Trump has talked about her as a vice presidential candidate. I think he's going to rethink that choice. Anyway, our number is 877-301-8970. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash gbhnews and facebook.com slash gbhnews. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Mark Regan and Jim Browdy. We're at the Boston Public Library, as we now are three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And we're talking about the President's State of the Union last night, what your impression was, what your takeaway was, and if you choose, talk about the Republican response through Alabama Senator Katie Britt. You know, it's interesting. Our coworkers, our staff, Marjorie, pulled together some headlines about each of their speeches. Here's Katie Britt, Newsweek. Republican Katie Britt ruthlessly mocked for State of the Union response. New York Magazine, Katie Britt's America sounds scary, but not as scary as Katie Britt. <laughs> Completely weird. Andy Barowitz, who you know we all love, the satirist from New Hampshire. Republicans discover woman even scarier than Marjorie <laughs> Taylor Greene. And here are the headlines on Biden. Drudge Report, conservative, even though he doesn't like Trump anymore. Biden roars on big night roast Trump. New York Post, conservative newspaper. Murdoch Biden paper. provides, he, Murdoch, it's Murdoch? It's a Murdoch paper. Yeah. Biden provides burst of energy the country doesn't normally get to see during State of the Union. So, I mean, it, that, I think, even if he didn't watch the speech, and the conventional wisdom is that most people who don't like Biden wouldn't watch the speech, they see this. I think it matters. So Carol from Wakefield just texted to say she thought that Katie Britt uh, was, she, she thought she was watching an SNL skit yeah. and not a real person up there, a United States Senator. Let's play a little bit more Katie Britt. This is when she's giving a very breathy delivery of her own personal story. Growing up, sweeping the floor at my dad's hardware store and cleaning the bathroom at my mom's dance studio, I never could have imagined what my story would entail. To think about what the American dream can do across just one generation, in just one lifetime. It's truly breathtaking. It's just unbelievable. I mean, it's really unbelievable. You know what happened here? You know what happened here? Trump saw her in some line somewhere. That she's is 40, She's 42 years old. She's a very good-looking woman. She is. Uh, her husband paid for, play for, the England, Patriots. for the England Patriots. He Somebody thought, Brit. You know, as you notice, he brings in really good-looking young lawyers. Oh, I hadn't um, noticed even that, Even if no. they can't really do the job, as yeah. his last door couldn't. Yeah. And, this, and this woman. And she's never done TV before. You did TV for well, a long time. Well, she's probably done TV in Alabama. Well, I, I don't think in, in this kind of Not way. Not in this kind of look, level. Reading right. into the, uh, reading I agree. Into the what you call it, teleprompter. You did TV. I did I some did. TV. Yes, you did. You, you have to learn how to do that, right? Yeah. Midway through, they realized this was a disaster. <laughs> but it was too late to change at that point. That's what happened here. Okay, here's one more clip from Joe Biden. This is part of his ad-libbing. This is uh, when he's uh, addressing some of the Republican lawmakers in the room who weren't happy with him. The can-read clip. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill? I'll be darned. That's amazing. The Border Patrol Union has endorsed this bill. 
The Federal Chamber of Commerce is a, yeah, yeah. You're saying low, look at the facts. I know, I know you know how to read. Ooh, Adele in Providence, you are next on Boston Public Radio. We're obviously talking about the State of the Union. Hey. Hi. Hi. I, never watched, but, but, I love listening to you guys. Thank you. However, I was really annoyed yeah. yesterday with you talking about the president's age because yeah. you're falling into the trap where everybody has to be young. By the but way, I think, Adele, oh. I don't want to get in an argument with you. That We've never said that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Donald, uh, uh, Joe Biden, before last night, I have found in his performances, his pro public presences, to seem very old and very tired. Unlike, for example, another 81-year-old, Bernie Sanders. So it's not about uh, the age. It's about how you perform what you do. And last night was very heartening. But go ahead, Adele. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. No, it was fantastic. Okay, I wrote notes down. First of all, first of all, the speaker at making faces, which was horribly distracting. Um, Mothers for Liberty, that was the woman that was speaking for uh, the Republicans mm -hmm. with her cross at the kitchen. That's where she belongs. Um, okay, Del, thought, we got to go. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Quickly. And one more thing. I really thought that Biden was fantastic with how he had the conversation with the audience. It yeah. was like working with, like Queen. Queen had people responding to him. I thought he was wonderful. I'm glad, we're really glad you were Adele, happy. Thank Adele, you. thank you for the call, appreciate it. For the call. You know, in fairness to Katie Britt, a lot of other people have botched these uh, responses, right? We Remember Marco Rubio with, with the water? Seriously drinking the water bottles all during his speech. Yeah. Did Joe Kennedy, the congressman, did he do a rebuttal to a president? The elder thing? Joe Kennedy? The younger Joe uh, Kennedy, I don't, I don't think oh, so. Oh, the younger Joe Kennedy did do one, did right. Did he do one? That's yeah, what he had, I forgot the, about he had, the, that. He had the, the Vaseline or something right. on his lip, and nobody could think of what we he was saying. We actually talked to him about that. Yeah, because after he had too much Vaseline yeah. on his lip. Yeah. Anyway, Elaine in Somerville, thank you for calling. Hello, Elaine. Hi. Hi. Um, I thought that I thought that Biden did good. However, I thought that the media once missed uh, an opportunity to really give the public. A, I'm here in the background. Is that okay? Yeah, Elaine. unfortunately, you're yeah. breaking up, and I'm sorry. Uh, we got to let you go. My apologies. By the way, you know who we haven't mentioned who actually showed up last night? Who? George Santos. Oh, yeah, Shows George up Santos. in the I chamber. About that. Apparently, yeah. even if you're, I'm serious about this, even if you're expelled and indicted, I'm not sure if you're convicted, if it's okay. I don't think it is. You're still entitled to floor privileges. Did you see that also William Kennedy? Uh, the former uh, Justice Supreme Court's William yep, Kennedy, he right? There. He was there in a robe kind of thing, standing right behind the six present members of the uh, court. And Santos, thank you, Jamie, I forgot. He announced he's running again for Congress. The same seat that he, oh, a different seat, he's moving? Well, that'll really be an uplifting experience. Uh, did you want to say something? Or a lot of people that don't like Biden think he was on drugs last night. Adderall, says Art from Breast Well, you know what my reaction is? Yeah. Keep taking the drugs. That's <laughs> somebody what else, I think. Somebody else said he stole some of Hunter's cocaine, which was not why very are you nice. reading? Why, why are you reading that? Be Tim because I want to have some people here who, okay. thinks he, who thinks he was awful. Oh, uh, the Stepford wife is a lot of people's response to uh, Katie Britt in the kitchen there. I think there's that. There's that. Yeah, I yeah. think there's a little bit of that. Tim in Worcester, you're on Boston Public Radio. You have about 30 seconds. Take it away. Oh, I, I love the uh, speech. Uh, fantastic yeah. uh, delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, he only stammered a couple of times. One thing I wanted to add, Jim, is that she should have said, I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> that actually is a better oh, invitation than Tim, mine, that Tim. Was thank very, you. That was very, very good. <laughs> Tim, thank you for the uh, call. We appreciate it. When you do something like that, do you remember I've told the story before. Marjorie, when I first knew her, would talk about she wrote a column she didn't think was very good, went back to the yeah. Herald, and she assumed that everybody was staring at her thinking that was the worst column I ever read, and of course they probably didn't even read it, much less think that. Mm -hmm. Do you think when you have an embarrassment like this on a national stage that you're afraid to go out of your house the next day? I mean, this is her huge first 
huge moment in the sun and sort of a trial. <laughs> Zoe just said, my ear, she doesn't leave the house. She should stay in the kitchen. That's a very good, <laughs> she, that's, a very, that's her deal. She's in the I kitchen withdraw the question. with the coffee machine and the pot of plants. That's where, she, that's where she's uh, staying. Okay, fine. Okay, we are moving on we after are this. Moving on. Um, we're going to ask our guests a little bit later in the show what they thought of gonna last get, yeah, night, We're going to get reaction from everybody because yep. we're not uh, through with this baby yet. No, we're not. Up next, live music Friday, courtesy of the fabulous White Snake Projects. They're next on Boston Public Radio. Like clockwork. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio, live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash gbh news, facebook.com slash gbh news. Next time we're here at the library is Tuesday from noon to one on, oops, from one to two on, is that right, one to two? One to two on Tuesday. Boston Mayor Michelle Wu will be joining us for a live and obviously here to take your questions and ours. It is now time for Live Music Friday on BPR at the BPL. Perfect timing for this particular group, courtesy of the artist slash activist production company White Snake Projects. The latest show, premiering next week, kicks off a season long celebration of the liberating power of small d democracy. The show is Sing Out Strong, Emancipated Voices, 11 totally original, community-orchestrated pieces. We'll explain that to you in a minute. The group's founder, artistic director, and opera maker, Cerise Jacobs, is here with us at the interview desk. We're great, glad to see you again, Cerise. Welcome Hi, back. Jim. As is White Snake Project's community uh, director, Andres Belasteros. Andres, it's great to meet you. Thank you for being here. You can catch a performance of the show on the 26th and 27th at the Boston Public Library's Mattapan branch and the Brookline Public Library. They'll also be performing for families at Josiah Quincy Elementary School next Friday the 15th. We'll give you these dates again. No tickets or RSVP. For more information, go to whitesnakeprojects.com. Great to see you both. Dot org. Dot org. That's what org. I meant to say, Sarita. That's, that's what Whitesnakeprojects.org. <laughs> Great okay. to see you both. So, so... For people that don't know about you, Cerise, let's start with you. Give us the history and the origin of, of White Snake Projects. So I am uh, born, raised, educated in Singapore. So I, when I came to America, I have three intersectionalities. I learned this word living in America. <laughs> okay, I'm an immigrant. I, uh, I'm a woman, obviously, and of course, a person of color. And this has driven the mission of White Snake Projects because when you live at these three intersectionalities, that's the ultimate outsider. So White Snake Projects is a platform to uplift marginalized voices, voices which would otherwise not be heard, to talk about issues relevant to our communities. That's what we do, and that's who we are. So Andres, how'd you, you're uh, relatively new to the field, a couple of years from what I understand. How'd you get involved, and why? Yeah, um, well, how did I get involved? Uh, Cerise called me, and uh, if you have ever had a conversation longer than about 10 seconds with Cerise, you know how persuasive she can be. Uh, so she talked me into joining the company. Um, it really wasn't very hard because the mission of the company really aligns with 
uh, what I love and what I do. I was a teacher at the Boston Arts Academy oh, for several oh, years. Yeah, yeah. So I'm uh, education, something that's really important for me. Community work. I'm also a composer, so music is something that's really important to me. You know, when we met Cerise, one, I'm going to paraphrase what she said to us, but I remember it well. Is you know, there's this attitude about how opera is, has this exclusionary nature, which I think it does. It took me a long time to sort of find an entry point. You guys change all that. Is that not fair to say? That is definitely the goal. And how do, how, how do you think you achieve that? Because I, I believe you do. Yeah, um, there's a bunch of different ways. One is just aesthetic, right? We're open to different genres and mixing different genres with what you might think of as opera. Um, so we've had hip-hop music on our stage. We've had rock on our stage. And we also deal with living creators uh, telling contemporary stories. Yeah, how do these compositions come about? Explain the genesis of these for people. So for this particular project, for Sing Out Strong Emancipated Voices, we have uh, brand new lyrics written by community members, uh, including students here in Boston and the composers. We did a call for composers nationwide, and we've got young composers setting these new lyrics to music. It's terrific. Well, and from what I read about Sing About Strong, too, that it's, it's specific uh, uh, groups of people, too, people who lost someone to COVID, um, people who are incarcerated uh, um, or exile families. I mean, tell us about that, Sarita. Yes, well, you know, Sing Out Strong is, uh, I'm just so proud of this I initiative because it, uh, I believe that everybody, you don't have to be a professional writer or musician to be able to bring beauty in this world. And Sing Out Strong is the opportunity to involve community in art making. And what we do is we try to pick a theme for our season. So, for instance, when George Floyd was murdered and we decided to devote our season to um, uh, exploring mass and long-term incarceration, we had Sing Out Strong Incarcerated Voices. And when, uh, and the anniversary of COVID, we had Sing Out Strong Remembered Voices yeah. where people who had lost uh, loved ones to COVID submitted their stories of their loved ones and we had composer set that to music. So this democracy voting thing is like the seventh or eighth different iteration of Sing Out Strong. Is that not right? Absolutely. Could you raise your mic just to drop, Cerise, if you don't mind? Cerise, you probably don't like this topic, but I, could you explain your transition from big time downtown lawyer, U.S. <laughs> attorney to this? You did it last time, and I talked to Marjorie about it afterwards. She's a prosecutor. And I said, I don't quite, I still, Explain the transition, then explain your quote. You told us this, too, that there are many similar strands in what you used to do and what you currently do. Try to convince us again. Go ahead. Okay, you mean I didn't convince you the first time? <laughs> uh, it was so long ago, so start over I was going to say, how could that be that What'd I didn't What did you do in your former you? life, Cerise? Okay, well, in my former life, I was a trial lawyer. Mm -hmm. I litigated patent, intellectual patent cases. I also served for five years at the U.S. Attorney's Office as a federal prosecutor, and I worked with the Secret Service and uh, the DEA, uh, FBI. I mean, you should have seen these agents when I walked into the room. <laughs> Sort of like Andres, they couldn't resist, right? Exactly. <laughs> yes. So how and why did you make the transition? And what is the common thread that you see okay. from what you did and what you do now? So lawyers have a bad rep, okay? Lawyers are viewed as sort of cold, calculating, soulless, uncreative people, but they're really not. Because mm. I was a lawyer and I'm proud of it. You can practice law at a very creative level. You can write brilliant, beautiful, creative briefs, problem solve, and if you're a trial lawyer, you stand before 12 strangers and you have five minutes to get them to believe you versus the other side. Now, all those skill sets are absolutely essential to being a good opera maker. We need to be good writers, we need to be good communicators, we need to be creative, we need to be unafraid to face down strangers and say, this is how it is. So you see, I was in training my whole life for this. <laughs> I'm convinced for the second time in a row, Cerise, I want you to know. 
We're talking to the people from White Snake Projects, and we're going to hear some beautiful, beautiful performances in about a minute or two. So, so elaborate a little bit more about the democracy part of this. And this is an election year, after all. What does this What does this mean, Andres? Yeah, since it's an election year, we decided this was going to be our theme for this year. Uh, so this is really just the kickoff of a bunch of different things. We believe the arts are really important in democracy because democracy is ultimately about ultimately about sharing your voice, and so are the arts. Uh, so we've got this Sing Out Strong series. We're going to do a panel and performance series at several branches of the Boston Public Library. Uh, and in September, we're going to have a big show, a brand new opera that our music director has called uh, Motown Meets Verdi. Oh, yeah, it's Motown very exciting. Meets Verdi, I love that. And it's about, <laughs> on International Women's Day, it's about uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, who was a civil oh. rights icon in Mississippi in the 60s. So it's, it's the whole year is dedicated to exploring this idea idea of democracy means every voice matters and art is a way for us to express those voices. Okay, so Cerise, uh, tell us what the first thing is we're going to hear and please introduce the performers if you could too. Yes, so the first thing you're going to hear is a um, song called Shout. The lyrics are written by one of my students at uh, the Boston International Newcomers Academy, and Andres and I visited with these students and helped them write lyrics for That's, the song. Uh, Gustavo Dos Santos. Yes, yes. Yeah. And the composer is Xavier Bueno. bueno. Yeah. Yes. Uh, our wonderful performer is Chihiro Osana, which you can see. She's a mezzo, and our wonderful pianist is Jamie LaRusso. So that is our team for this song. Here they are performing Shout. I know you said this, but I, I, now after having heard it, uh, Andra, starting with you, explain the whole process from concept to what we just heard. How does that all come together? Yeah, so we, uh, Cerise and I went down to the Boston International Newcomers, Newcomers Academy to kick off this process with mm. some students there. We had this broad theme of write something about voting as freedom. What does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. Especially if you can't vote. Like, it, it's really meaningful, this thing that yeah, you don't have, point. right? Um, so we got texts from students there, from other people in the Boston community, and we just had these lyrics. Then we had a nationwide call for composers, and our music director worked with a couple uh, renowned composers, Kitty Brazelton and Carlos Carrillo, to pick uh, just a few of them. And then once we had our composers, we said, hey, 
Here's the lyrics go wild. It's beautiful, and they did, they did go wild. It was re- truly beautiful. And Cerise, who's your audience? Who comes to see your performances? Well, it depends on where we are. So I hope. Uh, we used to do it in Chinatown at the Powell Center, and people from Chinatown will come. So this time when we're at the Josiah Quincy School, I hope that, you know, the whole Josiah Quincy community will come. Yeah. When we're at the Mattapan branch of the Boston Public Library, I hope that people from Mattapan will come. And then we'll be at Brookline. I hope uh, the Brookline community will come. So the, the point is to tour the neighborhoods, to give back to the community what they gave us in terms of their lyrics and their energy and their time. We're going to hear a second selection in a couple of uh, uh, minutes, by the way. Is there a website? I mean, Marjorie is reciting the locations, but in case people can't write them down, is there a website where people can learn all the locations, Andres? Yeah, if you go to whitesnakeprojects.org, there's a tab there right. for Sing Out Strong. All the dates are on there. Cerise, what do you hope, when beyond just incredibly beautiful music on a really timely topic, what do you hope the audience takes away from one of these performances? It's not just a love of the music, obviously. No. We, are, we have passed the point, Jim, where we can just believe in art for art's sake. Mm. We have this amazing platform where we can go forth and advocate for values that truly matter to our country and to our community. And that's what I hope the audience will sense, that they will sit there and listen to these words of these young people, of people just like them, and be inspired to go out and exercise their right to choose who the next president of the United States is going to be, because by so doing, We take control of our destiny, and that's what I hope for. Art-inspiring action. You know, just one thing about the opera portion of this. You know, uh, one of my kids is still living in New York City, and so for present at Christmas or birthdays, I get them tickets of things. And this, just night before last, they went to the Metropolitan Opera, which they would never go to. They were doing Madame Butterfly, Fuccini's Madame Butterfly, which to me um, is, is one of my favorite operas. I think when you go and see it and you hear it, you think, wow, where have I been? But I think that's not, that's not what young people are doing for the most part. So this is a real breakthrough you're offering them. Yeah, and I think this one's also really special because we're really intentional about how we're working with young people. We talked about the young writers, but a few of these songs, including Shout, which we heard a little bit ago, are also going to be performed uh, with the Boston Music Project. So you have these elementary... What is the Boston Music Project? Yeah, the Boston Music Project is this wonderful program that is in a bunch of different Boston public schools offering... uh, At the Josiah Quincy, they have several orchestras. At other schools, they have other kinds of music programs, but they're supporting youth in the arts, and in this case, it's so great to collaborate with them in actually creating the art. It's terrific. And the voices, I mean, these women over here, you know, you're, you, very few people have these kind of voices. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 we saw Tom Rush last week. We had him on here, and Tom Rush is fine, but I mean... <laughs> fine! He's very fine. talented. He's a very talented singer, but you know he's what I'm saying? He's a folk singer. But he's it, not an it's opera a, singer. I know, but I mean, but I mean, there's one thing to be able to be a folk singer. I mean, I could practically be a folk singer. Very few people Let me tell you something. Tom singer. Rush listens to the show. Okay, Tom Let's Rush. Let's hope no he is not made. listening today. Okay, all right. Well, I mean, how many Jesus. people would say, Bob Dylan, what a voice that is. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Where people he's that, a fairly talented songwriter, though. Talented, would you yeah. not agree? But this is something that is this a whole is other level to be able to sing like these women. By the way, what Marjorie was no, trying no, to say... No harm to Tom Rush. I love Tom Rush. We can delete all that. Let me explain to you what Marjorie's trying. We both had the same experience, by the way, with opera. Uh, I, we were talking the other day about the late, great Brian O'Donovan, and his great line was, uh, live music is where it's at. And I have to say, I had only been to one, for example, the symphony once in my life in New York City, and we were about to have Andres Nelsons on the show, the brilliant conductor, many years ago when he started, and I felt I had to go because I really didn't like that. And you go and you see live players, or you listen to live voices and a live accompanist, and it changes every, isn't that what you're trying to say? What I was trying to say is not that hard <laughs> to play a guitar, and it's not oh that hard God. to sing folk music. 
but it is really hard to do what these women do. Yes. Each genre has, you know, their their, their own skill set. Their Thank own you, skill Andres. Set. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. You can't change a woman who's determined to say her piece. That's that, right. You Thank you. Yes. Yes. I can yes. sure as hell try. Let yes. me tell you. Yes. Uh, futile. Futile. Jesus. By the way, we want to know. You, while you don't have hey, to bring us. We're well, running out of time. I know that. Get we have, no, we have four minutes was the thing. We were lucky. Can you buy these things online? Oops. You can buy okay. them online, There's, but can we're we not. Have a little, can we do that? We can't? No, can we? No, I don't think so. Okay. Okay, no camera. Thank you very much. What are we okay, hear? what are we hearing this time? And who's the additional <laughs> performer, Cerise? Okay, we are hearing now. Excuse Andres me. wrote the lyrics. He did not. Yes. Okay. Press for democracy. Maybe you want to ask Andres about his piece. Andres, I'd like to ask you about your piece, if you don't mind. <laughs> it's a, a story that's too long for, for the time we have left. Yes, but quickly, yeah, uh, Prayers for Democracy, the idea is that when you go into the voting booth, you're essentially sharing what your hopes are for the future. Perfect. Who's the additional performer? Uh, um, Aurora Martin. Aurora yes, Martin Aurora is Martin. soprano. <laughs> I, have, I don't have anything to do with this operation, <laughs> but I know. And the name of this is Prayers for Democracy. Yes, correct? and our composer is Kitty Brazelton for yes. this one. Welcome to all three of you. Repeats across the land. The chapels of democracy. The and chapels of democracy. The chapels of the media paper press. Each a silent plea for something yet to be. from White Snake Project's production of Sing Out Strong, wow. Emancipated, Vo Emancipated Voices, excuse me, to cash performances happening all throughout the month at libraries around Greater Boston. You go to whitesnakeprojects.org. That is whitesnakeprojects.org. Wow. No tickets, no RSV RSVP needed. You just show up. Thank you so much for being with us today. You both, this is an absolute wonderful treat. That was beautiful, you three. Thank you so much. It was really beautiful. After the new news, it's GBH's Kelly Cross. You're going to hear about Donald Trump. He's just come up with the $90 million to pay E. Jean Carroll for defaming and sexually assaulting her. She's also going to tell us about this bizarre claim that Michelle Obama is too quote-unquote racially intense to run for political office. Callie Crossy is next. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library.
we're responsible for staffing to move the family into their apartment and then to provide case management for 12 months after they're there. The, the arrangement is, is that we are helping the family integrate, become sustainable, Eastern Browdy, I am Marjorie Egan. You are listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library as we do every Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesday and Friday. Thank you. And now, thank you. Thank you very much. And on Wednesday as well, we're going to be here three days a week. On Tuesday, we're going to be joined by the mayor of the city of Boston, Michelle Wu, for an hour of Ask the Mayor. She'll take our questions and yours. That's one to two here on Tuesday at the Boston Public Library. Hello again, Jim. Hey, Marjorie. Marjorie just asked me to say the following, and I'm very proud to say it. Uh -huh. For those who see the women from White Snake Projects as sort of to opera, <laughs> what Tom Rush is to folk music, Marjorie would like to tell you that Tom Rush, who happens to be a very good friend of ours, or at least was until 10 minutes ago, is performing at the Boston City Winery tonight. Okay. I'm not done. He's doing a benefit for one of the most wonderful organizations, the Pine Street Inn. There are a few tickets available if you go to TomRush.com, Marjorie. Okay. okay, here's my point, Jim. What is your point? Voices, voices, voices like that are born... Yeah. Uh, other voices can be learned yeah. and improved upon. Let me hear you sing something. I, I'm, uh, believe me, I'm, I would not Why don't you sing Urge for Going while you're at it? Go ahead. There's not, no regrets. I would not. Callie's going to sing. Oh, oh no, my Callie's going with the voice. I think she oh, could I do a fine version of Urge for We're joined now at the going. desk by someone who really can sing and has sung on our show, Callie Crossley. Callie is the host of Under the Radar with Callie Crossley, which you can catch Sunday nights right here on 89.7 and 6. You can also hear her Callie commentaries on Mondays for GBH's Morning Edition, and obviously She's also the co-host for GBH's The Culture Show, which airs daily at 2 o'clock right here in 89.7. Hey, Kelly. Right. Hello. So, Kelly, <laughs> no, just because one has sung here doesn't mean that one can sing. Okay. No. Well, actually, you can. You really can sing. I yeah, was, some people can, can really sing, sing, and some people can't. But anyway, yeah. yes, uh, Kelly, uh, we were talking about the reaction to Joe Biden's uh, State of the Union speech last night. I mentioned before that Peggy Noonan, who used to be a speechwriter for mm -hmm. uh, Ronald Reagan, has written for the Wall Street Journal for years. The headline in her piece was something like, "The old boys still got some life in them." Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you agree with her. What you think? What, what's your reaction to last night? Well, I think you have to put aside um, all of those years where there was a certain level of decorum about this speech. That's gone now. Gone. Uh, so when you understand that, then uh, President Biden decided, I'm going to meet the people or the perception of where the people are about me where they are. And I'm coming out strong. So for those who say it sounded like a uh, campaign speech, they're not wrong. But... You know, he felt like this is my opportunity to make the, the statements that I need to make. The number one thing which came up in the discussions you were having with people calling in that people can constantly say is, I don't know what he's done. What has he done? Nobody knows what he's done. So, you know, he took that opportunity yep. to say. And more importantly, I think uh, to make his case, he laid plain what you will get if you don't, if I you go in a different really direction. Important. And I think that that was uh, what he wanted. He didn't want to get 
mixed up with anything else. I don't want you to be co confused. Understand what the choices are. And, you know, that's what it is. So it'll be left to history to decide whether that was a wise move. I would say for him at this moment, it was. So I have been of the opinion, which I am no longer as of about 10.30 last night, that Biden was, ending up, was going to end up not running this cycle. And of mm. course, you know who I thought was going to run, yes. Michelle Obama. <laughs> yes. Now, there have been a couple. Well, I did. I mean, yes, I did. And, you, you know, said, you whatever. And Michelle Obama <laughs> said for the 4,000th time this week yes. that she was uh, not going to run. And, uh, uh, and obviously, Joe Biden is running. He's the, he has their full support. She says, but uh, can we play a little sound from uh, the former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, on Sean Hannity's show? Mm -hmm. And I want to get your reaction. Uh, this is near the end of February. He's talking about uh, Michelle Obama with uh, Sean Hannity. Here is uh, the former Speaker, Newt Gingrich. She's more radical than Barack, and she's more uh, racially intense than Barack. And she can't explain the amount of money they've got, the size of their mansion. I mean, you know, they managed for eight years to live out a myth that was a lie, that they were really normal, everyday people, but they're not. Now, they're both radicals. But she's much like Hillary, is much more radical than, than Bill Clinton. Uh, Michelle is more radical than Barack. Racially intense. She is more racially intense. What does that mean, uh, Kelly? To and you? living a lie. And living a uh, lie. Yeah. yeah. Well, first, I would suggest that he's uh, saying it because she's he's responding that way because she's a brown-skinned black woman. I'm going to put it out there. Uh, Barack Obama is not, so you know that allows him some some. Uh, extra racism to throw on it. The whole business about living out a, a myth of being ordinary people, as Michelle Obama has said any thousands of time, we would not have anything had Barack not written a best-selling book, which the next line in her speech is, not a plan, <laughs> because, you know, we were just lucky. He wrote a best-selling book, and that catapulted us to a different space. But without that, we would be paying off student loans even as we speak. Yeah, and you know what? Yeah. We all remember from her terrific book that she lived in a, a tiny apartment where they had a, a curtain between her and her right. brother. They shared a bedroom, right? her and her brother. And her father had MS, right? right? And he had to struggle every day to get down the steps of that bad apartment to work, to get to work, which he did uh, it, right through all his illness. So, I mean, he's got, he's got a hell of a nerve. Well, well we are... We're taking words and listening to words from a guy um, that we know at the time what he did with his, no, I don't think ex-wife. No, no, you know, she was he still served wife. her. You know, Wait right. a second, she was, uh, yeah. recover she was suffering from cancer at the yes. time. Yes. 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 And he brought her the divorce papers that is to correct. the hospital room That's right. before That's he right. went on to wife number two and then he went on to wife number three right. since then. So yeah. if anybody's radically crazy, I would say it's he. Um, I mean, that was just oof, disgusting. I'll never forget that about him. And this is a guy who had plenty to say about Barack being radical back in his day as well. So um, here's, the, here's the thing that I think um, has kicked him off as well. I didn't realize until reading another piece about this rumor that uh, folks are trying to get Michelle Obama to run that an entire panel discussion was devoted to Michelle Obama perhaps being parachuted in as the Democratic nominee um, at the Conservative Political Action Conference. I mean, this has such life. It's crazy. I got news but for you. If they had <laughs> invited me onto that panel, I would have gone to have her parachute in to the Democratic. Her, was, her book was on the bestseller list for oh, like, yes. oh, well, like two years or yes, something, it wasn't was it? Like, I, I think it may still hold the title of the the number one Plus, best selling. When the audio book she narrated. Yes. I mean I mean and, and I was surprised. Yes. yes. I didn't know and, that. Yes. And I was that. going into this thinking, oh, you know, first lady yes. book, first lady book. It no, was it's really it was good. a great book. It's and really she was good. so real. Remember how she complained about Barack, you know, kind Jetting of sat, sachets in, right. <laughs> knowing everything, and she's studying every T and crossing every line. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was really, she was honest right. about her marriage, which was unusual too, I think. She was also honest about how um, every now and then you run across somebody who is just so unusual, and if you're in a personal relationship with them, you have to decide, can I do this? Yeah. Can I give them the space to have the breadth and depth of their talent? 
and be okay with that, or is it going to eat at me all the time? I thought that was yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah, you know? yeah, because obviously yeah. two really smart people right, and right. with very ambitious So anyway, I, I just think it, this is playing out the same way as the Taylor Swift. You know, they're all saying, oh, my God, she's going to at the last minute endorse uh, uh, Joe, Joe Biden. Biden. And so there's a lot of folks whipped up about the possibility of either Michelle Obama for, I think, reasons you've stated, Jim, that if she decided she would do something, there would be a great amount of excitement. She said for the 4,000th four thousandth time, she did. I'm not doing it. However, what they would like to have happen that didn't happen the last go-round is to have her on the campaign trail. And so there is a lot of discussion about maybe she is the closer on the campaign well, trail. Well, she did campaign. Biden. She didn't campaign as much as the conventional wisdom right. is Harris and Biden right. would have liked her and I'm going to say do. she didn't want to step on um, Kamala Harris. Yeah, yeah I think that's... You know, Having said that, that, let's before we leave this, mm -hmm. while we're praising her and her book, and I think both deserve praise, as you know, I'm a huge fan of hers, and I haven't read the book, but I know you two have, racially intense. I mean, talk about, you know, like... <laughs> if you're so threatened by... I mean, you just they're threatened by um, her perceived ability to move people. That's it. And so... Uh, also remember that her uh, dissertation had something to do with examining some disparities, and you know that got blown up into she's like a radical. She, yeah. You know, her whole agenda has always been, and um, it's not. So this is Newt Gingrich, who delivered papers to his then wife while she was in the hospital with cancer. So I'm going to say, <laughs> you yeah. know what? Not Consider a good source. the source. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you know. yeah. We're talking to Callie Crossley. So Callie, we intended to say to you today. Monday is the deadline for Trump to come up with 85 to yeah. $90 million yeah. dollars bond or cash so that he can appeal the, uh, the sexual abuse uh, uh, finding verdict in the E. Jean Carroll case. But right before it went on the air, he posted $91.6 million dollar bond. And for those who don't understand, when you don't have cash mm -hmm. to post a bond, you have to go find somebody who will post the cash yeah. for you. You pay a fee and you have to come up with some collateral. The collateral is almost never 100% of the amount. And right. so my question to you is, who? based upon his history <laughs> yeah. of never paying exactly. his lawyers or his bills, I'm serious, who is crazy enough to give $93 million without $93 million of property guaranteeing it? Well, I, I point you to the fact that there's a GoFundMe <laughs> well, but that's not $93 million. I'm just letting you hey, know. He could get it. He I mean, could get maybe it. Maybe he could get it. Yeah. He's selling sneakers, designer <laughs> sneakers. I'm just putting together where the money could come from. But, you know, listen, this has come up many times, and uh, people smarter than me have said he's always had people pay the lawyers. So the reason that he still has lawyers and he still has advisors who are quite capable is that somebody else is paying them. He's not. Now, well, including his campaign contributors, well, by the way, go. which unfortunately yeah. is legal. Right. So I assume, other than he can't do that, he can't reach, no, because can't. that was an issue. That is whether correct. Whether he was going to go reach into that pool and pay this bill. So he can't do that. So somebody feels very strongly uh, that he should have the opportunity to be in the White House again, and they uh, feel strongly enough to give him 91 point. Three, what did you say? 91.6 million. million. Yes. And we should just say, I believe he has, is the eighth, I think he has 17 days. I may be off by one or two. I know the trial in New York is March 25th. I think it's March 23rd, 24th, something, where he has to come up with a $450 million in the, uh, uh, the, the fraud case brought and uh, won by uh, the Attorney General of New York State. And you should also say that the, he had asked just as recently as oh, last yes, Thursday yes, yes. to put off paying this, and the judge said no, which yeah. is why he had to come up with it. You know, we have so many negative stories on the show. Marjorie and I had the oh, same reaction. This, this is story a great okay, out of Coronado, Cal uh, Coronado, Coronado. California. Yes, it's a great story. About a black family and an Asian American family this and their relationship incredible. is just so beautiful. Can you tell the story, Kelly Crossley? Yeah, I, at first I read it, I said, is this real? And then it turns out it is. Um, so in 1939, the Dongs, a Chinese American family, were trying to find a house in Coronado, California. And there were restrictive housing laws. Those exist all over the place. Um, against many ethnic groups. In this case, in California, it was against uh, the Dongs and to, to a large extent, some black folks as well. But Emma and Gus Thompson, black entrepreneurial couple, that means they didn't have to work for anybody else, which is why they had some money of their own, 
allowed the family to rent the property that they had when nobody else would rent property yeah. to them. Um, and now, here we are all these years later, eventually the Dongs, uh, you know, bought the property outright, then added to it, then built on it, and so turned it into a, 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 a rental housing uh, situation and an apartment complex, yeah. eight unit apartment complex, worth now combined value, they added on to it, as I said, $8 million from that gesture. And uh, Gus's family was connected to uh, the enslavement uh, in this country. So he and his wife just felt like, wait, hey, we know what this is like not to be able to have access to some of the things that everybody else did. So they uh, rented it to them, then eventually sold it to him. Now the children, the grown children, are taking the money that they made or could make from selling the home and investing it in a program to support black students' education. They feel very strongly about education. They say what the Thompsons did enabled um, them to go to school. Their parents were able to obviously have a place for them to live and then they could afford to send them to school and so forth and so on. So it's just it's a an beautiful amazing, story. they didn't, uh, the, the Thompsons never asked them, you know, for anything. They did not feel that this was an obligation. They tried to figure out what can we do yeah. that would make this uh, bigger than even the gesture that they gave to us. So the kindness, the understanding of what the racial limitations were there at that time and, you know, what ends up happening for, we don't know, unknown yeah. and untold numbers of students who will benefit from this generosity is fabulous. And you know what else I loved yeah. about this? I mean, these people, obviously, they, they did well to be able to donate $5 right. million. Dollars, but these are not like multimillionaires. They don't no. have like hundreds of millions no. of dollars. The, the house appreciated. Yeah, the house appreciated. Oh, yeah. So they said the mm -hmm. house the combined value of the apartment mm -hmm. building in the, in the house, mm -hmm. family members say, is about $8 million. Mm -hmm. So maybe they have, I don't know, maybe they have $10 million. But what I'm pointing out mm -hmm. is they're giving almost perhaps half their wealth, if not yeah, more. Right. So this is a big donation, which right. is, I think, I mean, um, really it's just, it's just, it's significant. Really, it's beyond. Uh, this is interesting because, as you know, we're doing a series called What is Owed about reparations. Yes. So they're giving Sarah it to the Smith, our S colleague. SDSU Black Resource Center, okay? And they say that it coincides with the California lawmaker's introduction of 14 reparations bills mm -hmm. to address the state's legacy of racial discrimination. Now, again, they, they didn't think the Dong family and children, this is, you know, we didn't have to give back to them as reparations, but here is a way to stop the cycle yeah. um, of what has been lost and what is owed as the, as the, uh, as the podcast is examining right now. Um, and we can do this just one to one and and it's going to be more than one to one because we don't know how many students uh, get this it's just really it's yeah it's a great story you know then you think and you have to ask yourself now what am i doing <laughs> do you I know ask, what i mean i mean i think you i ask myself that every morning <laughs> <Charlie>. <laughs> what Who am, am I, I doing why am i here exactly <laughs> You should yeah. check out the story. Check it out. It's really uh, something. It's, it's beautiful out of yeah. Coronado, California. Yeah. So one of the things we are masters of on the show is the awkward transition. Yes. So we're going to go from this beautiful story about this black family and their kindness and generosity and then the kindness and generosity of an Asian American family who they reached out to, to snacks in America, <laughs> if we can. Because yeah. it is Friday. Yes. Apparently there was uh, some sort of research done yes. to see... In each of the 50 states, and I assume the District of Columbia, yes. what the favorite snacks are. And I, I will share with you, in case you were interested, this is really distressing. In, in terms of people who are listening today, we know a lot of you are listening to us on streaming, but for people who are within our sort of catchment area, Massachusetts, do either of you know what the favorite snack is? I was stunned is? by this. Rice Krispie yeah. Treats. Right. It I know. Seem right. that New Hampshire, right yeah. Rice Krispie Treats, yeah. and Rhode Island, yeah. Doritos. Well, Doritos I can I could get. see. So yeah. could I. Not me. Right. Absolutely. Really? What would, you, what would be your favorite And I'm snack? with the Lay's Potato Chips in New York State. Well, you want mine? Yeah. Pigs in blankets with Dijon mustard. <laughs> that's what it would be. Well, that's kind of a that's yeah. kind of that's a, a snack. Yeah, it's not a snack. Kind of, you go to Whole Foods, you buy a frozen pack, you put them in the oven, and you eat them. Uh, 
Yeah. You're kind of moving into the hors d'oeuvres. Rice, yes. crispy, That's treats. Or, those are hors d'oeuvres. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is like you can go, go into the 7 Eleven right. and buy some. You ever eaten a rice like crispy pot. treat, either yes. of you? Yeah, yeah, of course. Horrible. I don't like, I don't like yeah, it at all. Horrible, it's like cardboard but, yeah. with sugar on it. They're, is that correct? They can be good, but my point is that just doesn't seem like that would rise to the level of a tops for many of the states here. It feels weird. Now, Tex Mix was in the mix, by the way. And Cheetos. Yeah, Cheetos. Huge. And, and Fritos. Yeah, right. Cheetos I can see, too. Yes, I mean, I you know, you eat yeah. one Cheeto, you have to eat them all. So what would yours be, really... Marjorie, if you're mocking me for pigs in blankets? What would yours be? <laughs> I love lace potato chips. You do? I mean, I know that other people make, you know, Cape Cod potato chips probably a little bit mm. better for you if you're going to eat chips, but they don't have as much salt and as much <laughs> fat yeah. as the lace potato chips, which you really want to go to. If you need a little, right. you're a little hungry, you know, before dinner, they got the job done. This all came about, by the way, because National Snack Day Monday. Oh, so, so yeah. Oh, was? Biden yeah. mentioned shrinkflation it. of Snickers bars last night. He did, actually. the night. word. He yeah. did. His, his, that you're paying more for the Snickers right. bar, and there's less of a Snickers bar inside the Snickers bar. Look at the bar. ice cream. You that's right. You want to see right. some shrinkflation? That's it's serious. Is it less than the ice cream? Oh, my God. Go look at what, what used to be Jenny's is like maybe two scoops now. And Jenny's was expensive to begin with. Delicious, but good. <laughs> I did I'm not personally, know that. from a snack perspective, now obsessed with Skinny Pop. Obsessed. Skinny Pop is very good. Skinny Pop. Very good. There's no people. aftertaste? Yeah. No, it's really no good. Aftertaste. They have mastered they the have. tasty of yeah. a really? low-calorie snack. And it doesn't okay. taste low-calorie. And, and Yasso Pops. I'm a, I'm a oh, hunger. Yasso Pops are fabulous. They're they're just, fa we eat a ton good. in my house. I we know. Why ASSO? They're, they're the yogurt pops. Really not, cheap at market and basket. Really expensive everywhere else. Not the birthday cake one. That's the no. nasty one. No, mint but chocolate else, chip is yeah, really good. Yeah, sort of brownie. Now, Marjorie, I don't a lot even of people. Know about those. Yeah, Yasso, just check them out. Okay. They're in the freezer yeah, right. department. Yeah. Yep. A lot of people are texting and saying, and I assume you know the answers because I do not know mm -hmm. of snacks. Do you have any idea what Tom Rush's favorite <laughs> snack? <laughs> Okay. I'm curious to know what you. his favorite snack you. would be. I went, I went and saw Tom Rush. Oh, that's yeah, a good point. In my hometown. Why'd you go if he's not as good because as the opera he's singers? he's terrific. He is terrific. Uh -huh. But I think next time a little we, late we now, speak Marjorie. to Tom. Oh, did you, get some did you get a text from Tom Rush? No, I just, okay. he's a friend of mine. Yeah, he used to be a friend of yours, actually. Wait a minute. Maybe his snack is lemon water because that's Marjorie right. is singing and he needs to improve his singing. Well, I think he's a great singer. I just don't think he's an opera singer. That's okay. all. This all right. is you know? Really, I have I have given you fifty opportunities to dig yourself out, and I you keep Tom digging Rush. deeper every time. I have time. all his albums. I have well, not anymore. I have all his songs on yeah. my Spotify list. Yeah. I love Tom Rush. I went okay, and saw. I've, I've seen him multiple times. He's yeah. great. I used to have him when I was in college. Mm -hmm. We had a big blow up picture of Tom Rush on the wall. Okay. He was a very impressive try, looking Marjorie. guy with the curl. But I just don't think he's an opera singer. Do you well, think he's you an opera singer, maybe, Kelly? Well, well, maybe you don't put it. Uh, the way you've described it is kind of a talent based thing, and maybe you talk about his expertise and the way that he's able to modulate his voice for certain genres. That's right. And his He's a brilliant is, songwriter, brilliant he's a singer. Brilliant, he's a brilliant Look, songwriter. I'm just trying to help her out. Well, <laughs> I, obviously, there's no, By the way, the New York Times reporting, this is no surprise, the Republican National Committee on Friday elected new leaders handpicked by oh, yeah. uh, Trump. Michael Watley, the chair of the North Carolina Republican Party, they really picked a good candidate for governor, too. A yeah. total racist. Who happens to be a black guy, by the way. Yeah. And uh, the uh, co-chair will be, do you know who the co-chair is, Marjorie Egan? Yes. His daughter-in-law. Laura, yeah. Laura Trump, Trump right. is the co-chair yeah. of, Laura Trump, not yeah. Laura, my apologies. Laura Trump, Laura yeah. Trump. But you know, uh, you know, okay, so that's the head of the Republican Party, which we have known for some time was Trump's party. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest achievement he made in leadership is that in every state, he has pretty much handpicked the leaders in every state. Yeah, yeah so, so they'll be able to talk about cheat a party more easily. From a, yeah, from a political standpoint, being solidly behind him, there's no place else for anybody who would like to raise a question about his candidacy to go. So, well, he is the, he's the de facto nominee. People. He'll yeah. formally be the yeah. nominee probably next, right. I think it's next Tuesday. Right. So, what are you doing Sunday night there? Two great stories. One about 10 million names, which is a project that came to be in a fascinating way. It grew out of the memory project for Georgetown, which has to do with Georgetown's uh, selling off uh, a number of enslaved Americans to pay for Georgetown and all of those descendants. And how now that has evolved into trying to search to identify all of the uh, relatives and folks who were enslaved. We're trying to they're trying to identify by name Ten, the 10 million enslaved yeah. men, women, and children. And the second story is about a new arts-focused uh, tour called Bori Corridor, which speaks to the Boricuan or Puerto Rican roots. Um, so I'll be bringing artists from Puerto Rico here 
to do a focused uh, tour in cities that have high rates of uh, uh, Puerto Rican uh, population, and Boston is the first stop. By the way, so. I was not laughing at you. What, J uh, what Jamie does, which is totally unprofessional, was waving is me. in the I, middle I, of a segment. I, yeah. Jamie's our lead producer. Yes. <laughs> Jamie gets a thing about a particular thing. He not only texts me while I am live on the radio, he does this. He holds up his phone like this, which obviously means I need to check it right away. <laughs> yes. And it is always some incredibly low rent, inappropriate <laughs> thing, well, what, which it? totally, I can't well, believe tell. me. Do no, tell. I, I do not think well, come we will be telling anytime soon. Why didn't I get the text? Because I live in the same low rent uh, facility <laughs> that he does. I'm looking at Callie my phone. Callie Crossley, it's great to see you. Don't thank see you it. so okay. much. Callie right. Crossley. Thank you very much, Callie Crossley. See you later. We've been speaking with Callie Crossley. She's host of, the Under, of Under the Radar with Callie Crossley, which you can hear Sunday nights, 89, 7, 6 o'clock. You can also hear her Cali commentaries on Mondays for GBH's Morning Edition. And Cali is co-host of GBH's Culture Show, which airs every day at 2. Cali's going to be on it right after 2 o'clock today. Um, that's when we are through, right after the news. Coming up, the other host of the Culture Show, GBH Executive Arts Editor and Culture Show host, Jared Bone. We're going to talk to him a little bit about the Oscars and the 150th anniversary, mm. who, knew, who knew, of a very important Don't tell what it is. and very personal piece of mm -hmm. male clothing, it's true, it's which great. I'm not going to reveal great. which exactly it is. Jared's going to do the unveiling, so as it speak. were. <laughs> He's next on Boston Public Radio, 89.7 <laughs> GBH. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I'm Mark and Jim Bradley. We're live at the library, streaming at youtube.com slash gbh news, facebook.com slash gbh news. I think you all know, starting this week, we're at the library three days a week. Tuesday, Wednesday was added, and Friday. And next Tuesday, which is our next day here, Mayor Michelle Wu joins us at the library for an hour to take your questions and ours from 1 to 2. We're joined now by Jared Bowen. He is GBH News' executive arts editor and host of The Culture Show, which airs daily at 2 right here on 89.7. Hey, Jared Bowen. Great to be with you. Nice to see you. Hello, Jared Bowen. So, um, Sunday night is the Oscars. We can't go through everything in the, uh, on the Oscars, but I figure you're touching on this on the, on the Culture Show. So, without giving away anything, anything particular... Uh, you think is going to be notable about the Oscars or what we should look for? Or what do you think? Well, as it seems to be the case in the last few years, I think we kind of already know who most of the winners are. I think the two exceptions are the best actor and the best actress category. Because best actor, I think, will be between Killian Murphy I hope for so. Oppenheimer. I love him. Who's the other one? I thought he's going to win in a landslide. Paul Giamatti for oh, the for holdovers. Oh, Paul Giamatti yeah. for the holdovers. Oh, yeah, yeah because Giamatti's been up a lot, and I don't know that he's always won. Has well, the he? Oscars are often not about the best performance of the year. They are often sort of a career award, yeah. so that could be the reason that it goes to Paul Giamatti. Uh, but I think it is going to ultimately be Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer, and it's also a best actress category. I think most people think that Lily Gladstone will win for Killers of the Flower Moon. However, Emma Stone has won a lot of the awards and the other award shows. And this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about with the Best Actor category because Emma Stone has won before. It's more reason to give it to Lily Gladstone. So we'll see. But I have to say, I think this is shaping up to be a really, really fun show. You do? Why? One of the things they're doing is they're bringing back five uh, category winners to present in each of the four acting awards. So we're probably going to see a whole array oh. of huge stars. Oh, 
That's fun. You know, five previous Best Actress winners presenting, I think, the Best Actor Award because usually they, they oh, cross gender. They do. Uh, so that should be a lot of fun. Do you think Oppenheimer's the best movie? I don't. Which what one is do you the best think? movie? I thought that uh, Poor Things was a really good movie. I thought that Killers of the Flower Moon, for some reason, and now I kind of blame Barbie, actually, because I did Bar- Barbenheimer, but I saw Barbie first, so I was a little you know, pinked out by the time I saw Oppenheimer, and it, Barbie was kind of so dazzling and fun that by the time I saw Oppenheimer... Which was, was not dazzling and fun. Bleak and a long yeah. day but everybody said it's going to win, and it's not even close, right, for best movie? Is that what, that's what the experts are saying. Yeah, Oppenheimer, yeah. 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 Okay, so you have nothing else to say about the Oscars? And it start, how great is this? It starts at 7 o'clock. It does not. I'm so Wait, glad. red carpet or the yeah. actual show? No, the award? actual, actual show. show. Oh, that That's is great. fabulous. That's great. Yeah, the, the problem with all these award shows is nobody's watching anymore, so they're doing whatever they can. So that's why I think it'll be a better show. Plus, they also have Catherine O'Hara and Octavia Spencer, Jennifer Lawrence, who are super fun people presenting. Oh, so good. Yeah, but, you know, I, well, I'm happy at 7 You're o'clock. You're a red carpet kind of guy, I'm, a, I do, I'm embarrassed to say. It. I watch ET, and you see the red carpet yeah. and whatever. Do you, uh, uh, if you're, it's on the West Coast is four o'clock though. I mean that's yeah. a, whatever. I have one other thing to say. Do either of you know who Matt Friend is? Oh, he's a very funny Trump imitator. Oh, no, and other a, no, excuse me. He's a very funny 250 celebrity yeah, imitator. Yeah, he does a lot of people. And he's, he's 25 years old. You can Google him. I, I, he's all over Twitter all the time. The reason I thought of him is he is at some event, black tie event, and he has wanted to do Paul Giamatti for Paul Giamatti. <laughs> Remember when Jay Farrow was on our show, who does one of the best oh, Obamas ever? He does. And he said the night he did Obama in front of Obama, he was so nervous he almost couldn't breathe. But wasn't he Farrow's a great Farrow's a former guy? SNL guy. He's brilliant. I love him. I really well, love him. Well, he was him. so down to earth. It's a big star. You know, he was very nice to us, I thought. Well, that's what it probably was. But he's also <laughs> really talented. But what's my... Oh, so he sees Paul Giamatti across the room from him, and he runs over. It's a 25-year-old kid. And does he puts a mic in Giamatti's face to interview him? Giamatti has no idea who he is, and he starts as he's interviewing, doing Paul Giamatti while he's interviewing Paul Giamatti, and it is incredible. And then there's all the stuff if you search around Twitter of him doing almost everybody as well as I've ever seen. What are they called? Imitator? What are they called? Impersonators. 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 As, as anybody. He's really yeah. talented. Matt Friend is And by the way, name. Mark Maron, who we had on earlier in the week, because he's got yes, this show right. tonight at the Chevalier yeah. Theater in Medford, he did. He does Oscar stars every year. He did a great interview with Paul podcast, Giamatti. Podcast, yeah. A podcast, yeah, he's a like, podcast. He seems like a, I, 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 Paul Giamatti. I love I, I, him. I feel like he's one of those characters that you assume he is who he is on screen, which is usually a misanthrope and grumpy, and he just seems like the most oh, delightful, wonderful. engaging, Do you know his father was? Person, of course. President, yeah. yeah, yeah. And... Oh, baseball, 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 baseball commissioner. Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. know, one last thing. And he died um, when he was he was pretty young. Yeah, so he didn't get to see Paul Giamatti's car- uh, yeah. c- career. Where yeah, I was. Um, one of the things I think is, you know, often these small movies really stay with you. And Holdovers is one of those small movies yeah. that really stayed with me. And Anatomy of a Fall is uh, a domestic thriller which I thought was really good, too. It's a foreign film. But is that was, one of the top ten? Is that nominated for Best Picture, too? It's, it's a foreign film, so I don't think it's in the best. No, there are other foreign it's, films. Oh, maybe it is. Well, it's definitely nominated in that category and probably will in that category. Yeah. Well, the other big one, I think it'll be a very good day for GBH on Monday because... Oh, all 20 odds. Days in Mariupol. It's yeah. a favorite. We had yeah. Rand who runs Frontline. It, if, if we said it that day. If you haven't seen 20 Days in Mariupol... Uh, it, it, it is yeah. the ultimate must Especially see. So now powerful. when we are pulling the so rug painful. out from exactly. underneath this, this nation. Okay, yeah. so one of the beauties of the culture show, and we're probably two of the biggest fans of the culture show, is you know, it, culture is too narrow. It's really everything. It's arts, it's entertainment, it's movies, it's that kind of thing. And one of the things I love you've done, you've only been on, how many weeks you've been on? Uh, we've been on three months. Three months, okay, only three months. And you've done fashion, I think, beautifully too. And I was not aware for this morning, it's something you wanted to cover, and I'm really glad you brought this up. This, of course, I assume the audience, does everybody know what this is the 150th anniversary of people here? Raise your hand if you know. You know, what is it? Nice try. Okay. <laughs> he said Mass Art, enough. which happens to be true. Is that true? Mass Art. Oh, thank you. You're oh. right. Thank you. Mass Art, he said. But it's also a fashion accessory that I know is really important to some people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know how you feel about it. So what is it? No, I do. I've heard. What is the what is it the 150th anniversary of? Uh, uh, Should I give a hint to the audience? Sure. Give a hint. Well, as a story from the Boston Globe says by yeah. Leanne Italy. Be careful. They're very coquettish. They reveal. They conceal. They're like a push-up bra. Perfect. What is it again? Do we have any audience guesses? Anyone? What is it? Say it quickly, loudly. 
This Zipper is an excellent answer, but that would be wrong. Thank you. Anybody no. else a little further back there? No? You're too shy? Only men. Oh, wait. You, what is it? Oh, Marjorie. Now you're giving what? me hints. Corset is good enough, too. That's also wrong. Well, what is it? It's kind of the corset down below. What it's, is it? It's the 150th anniversary of the Boston-born jockstrap. Oh, let's hear it for the jockstrap. <laughs> that is excellent. Thank you. Yeah, but I didn't know. They have an interesting history, jockstraps. Uh, well, uh, yeah, they, Go they, ahead. They, take they, it away. Take all the time you need. Okay. <laughs> Well, the year was 1874. Oh, Jared's getting a little red. Go and, ahead. <laughs> can we just be a little transparent? Sometimes I don't pick all of the topics I get to talk about. You so, picked this one. So this one was foist on That me. is not true. But Go this ahead. Is, this is fascinating. This Anatomy is, of a Fall is nominated for Best Picture. Thank you. It's Go ahead. Jim's fault. No, it's not my fault. Go ahead. Talk about the jockstrap for a while. Jim has a long, while. torrid history with okay, jockstraps. Okay, can we talk about the jockstrap a little good? So let's travel back to 1874. Right. Absolutely. On absolutely. The, on the cobblestone streets of Boston... Yeah. And C.F. Bennett trying to address the woes of bike messengers. Oh, exactly. that was it. That is it. Yeah, That's bumping right. along the cobblestone yeah. streets, mm-hmm. developed and invented the jockstrap, which, as the Globe pointed out in its article, is still holding up after 150 years, That's so right. to speak. And so, of course, it, it, it stayed <laughs> in the said culture. It. I didn't say holding up. He the said Globe holding said up. It. Yes. Oh, okay. And then it became a, okay. a huge part of gay culture in the yeah. 1970s, and it kind of turned into lingerie. And now the embr- the designers have embraced it. Tom. Ford Did you see Kristen Stewart's Versace. photograph? Yes. Oh my God! Rolling Kristen Stone. Stewart is on the cover of Rolling Stone, wearing a jockstrap. I mean, it is what it is, with her hand in her jockstrap. That's a pretty incredible was, photograph yeah, there. She got okay. a lot of flack for that. She this, did? Why, yeah. what, why? Oh, because people thought it was too risque. Oh. oh. Leanne Italy, she actually she's from the Associated Press, the What's piece it? ran in the Globe. But I think she's got some great descriptions here. Go you ahead. Know what she calls the jockstrap? No. The strappy little staple of your. Isn't oh, that a great that's line? Beautiful. Don't you yeah. think of a jockstrap as a strappy little staple, Jim? That's what I've always said. <laughs> so. But it, 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 it's, a, it's an instrumental piece of fashion that has, it is. has stayed. Okay. That's right. Yeah. They reveal, they can see. How do you feel about the jockstrap, Jim? Uh, well, I'll tell you exactly what I feel is. I, I didn't even know about it when Jamie called us last night and said, Jared demands we talk about the 150th anniversary of the jockstrap. I said, thank God Jared has such a broad yep. reach, so That's to speak. That's right. Jim was going to wear one outside his pants, but he changed his mind at the last okay. minute. No, I actually am in the second half of the show. I, it's a little early for that. Okay, let's move on uh, so that Jared doesn't melt into yep, the exactly. sidewalk here. So we're going to okay. take the things on your agenda here. In order, and I can't read my writing. Uh, what, what's the first thing there, Marjorie? Oh, the first thing I was looking at the text. Oh, messages, sorry, my Jim. apologies. That's okay. The first thing we're going to talk about uh, is uh, oh, uh, you're a DC. You're a DC. You're a DC. You're a DC. Excuse me. At the Huntington. So March 10th. Uh, so this is a piece by Matt O'Coin, who is a fast, fast, well, I, you can't even see rising anymore. He's a very young man and has been embraced in the classical music world virtually since the moment he entered into it, was the youngest commissioned composer at the Metropolitan That's Museum great. of Art. And so for Eurydice, uh, this, was a Ooh, ma- Eurydice. Yeah, this was a major piece of opera he did out in Los Angeles and, and, and at the Met. Did and you his, have one the other day? He was on the culture show. Yeah, absolutely. I know, yeah. Go ahead. Along with Sarah Rule, with whom he wrote this yeah. piece. And they have pared it down for this Boston Lyric Opera production, which is playing through March 10th at the Huntington Theater. And so he had this fascination with this myth, but then was introduced to Sarah Rule's play of the same name. And so the myth, of course, of Eurydice is really more about Orpheus, who is this poetic, lover of poetry and and music and of his wife Eurydice. She dies, she goes to the underworld and he's given a chance to bring her back and but the only way he can bring her back is if they're walking up the stairs, yes. he before her, and she, he, he can't turn around and look at her before re- he reaches the top. Spoiler alert, he does, and she's doomed to spend eternity in the underworld. Mm-hmm. Well, Sarah Rule decided, to, who's a fabulous playwright, she's written a number of works, she wanted to look at this myth through the prism of, uh, through the viewpoint of Eurydice. And what was her experience? And what I learned when we interviewed her at, uh, on the Culture Show the other day was that she lost her father when she was in her early 20s. And so that was something that she really wanted to carry through this work too, just thinking about these connections we have to family and, and what if we can connect with them in the afterlife? How do we connect with them? So in this opera, Eurydice, it really focuses more on her and we spend more time with Eurydice in the underworld, uh, the, the loss of memory, the reconnecting of, of loved ones with whom we've lost. Uh, we still have Orpheus, he's still part of it. Uh, we still have the Lord of the Underworld who is dressed in very, 
very fabulous costumes uh, in this production. I found it very, very moving, especially since it's about relationships and memory and considering the afterlife. And in this small chamber version of the opera, it works beautifully. And Matt O'Coin's music is, is just gorgeous. And we mentioned the other day, but Bear's mentioned because of the dreaded local angle, Matt is the son, son of, of the Globe's brilliant theater critic, who we've all known. He used to be a political writer, Don O'Coin. Yeah, I mean, he's had an incredible career, Matt O'Coin, right? He's a big star. He's still in his 20s. Is, is late he's 20s? Now, probably... I believe he's now in his 30s, so there is so much yet to come. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so speaking of March 10th, uh, and so that's Sunday. Uh, Eurydice is only at the Huntington until Sunday, I believe. And John Proctor as the villain is only at the Calderwood until yep. Sunday. Am I right yep. about that too? Yeah, and this, tell us about it. This is a Huntington Theater production, but at their, their, their second stage at, in the South End. This is a really interesting, very, very layered piece. So it's called John Proctor is the Villain. John Proctor was one of the people who was executed in the Salem Witch Trials and also depicted as a character in The Crucible. So this is something that really struck Kimberly Bellflower, who is the playwright of this relatively new play. And she looked at this through the prism of Me Too. And so she has written a play that sets us in a one stoplight town in Appalachia in Georgia in 2018. Just as Me Too, all of those conversations, the headlines are surfacing in the culture, there's a lot of dialogue. And we find this small classroom, high school classroom of young women. And what is happening in the ether begins to filter into their world. So one, they're fighting to have a feminist club. The, the local community doesn't want that to happen. The women shouldn't have their own independent voice or independent club. And then one of the girls uh, suddenly has to deal with accusations of her father having an in, uh, improper relationship with an employee. And then there is uh, another way that this comes directly into their classroom. I won't give too much away so as not to spoil it. But it becomes this really fascinating discussion as you look at it through the prism of the crucible, too, which is all about witch hunts and hysteria yeah. and yeah. blaming the victim. Yeah. And the reason it's called John Proctor is the villain is because he's held up as... Arthur Miller held him up as a hero, as a man who was accused by in the play by Abigail Williams, somebody with whom he had had a relationship, when he begins to accuse his wife and then later him of witchcraft, he turns it back on the victim. But knowing that he had had a relationship with her, if we look at this play now, it doesn't quite hold up. And John Proctor isn't the good man he's always been portrayed as for defending his wife, but he is kind of the villain for blaming blaming the, the woman, he, the young girl he actually victimized. So all of this comes and it is processed in this very tight, very smart, and actually very funny play, John Proctor is the villain. March 10th, only through Sunday at... At the College of Pavilion. Yeah, which yep. is great, which yeah. is a great, great, great venue. We're talking to Jared Bowen, the uh, host of the Culture Show and the, the arts thing. So, uh, I mean, you're the, I always forget, you're the what again? Just the executive arts, arts editor. Uh, executive arts editor. Okay, okay. Uh, tell us about these women uh, uh, who do ceramics, uh, Cuban avant garde, and up at the Boston College. McMillan, McMullen Museum. Yeah, the McMullen, free, which free. is which is always gorgeous. Free. Free. And it's, a, yeah, it's beautiful. It is gorgeous. And they just had a renovation too. They did. Yeah, another one. Oh wow, because it's not that old. It's not that old, um, but it, yeah, it's a, that's where Cardinal Law used to be. It was. He's gone now. He's he, literally <laughs> gone now. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> he's yeah stepped into the other world. Yes, <laughs> maybe the underworld. Who knows? Uh, but anyway, the lost generation, women ceramicists, and the Cuban uh, Cuban avant garde. This is a, a discovery by Elizabeth Thompson Goitsueda, who is a curator and professor at BC, and she's looked at this time in Cuba when women came to the fore after World War One. Were making ceramics in this workshop outside of Havana. And they had, many of them had gone to this really, really well-known arts academy. And as they're making ceramics, as Cuba begins to close off, and these are more utilitarian objects, or well, this is before the revolution, actually, uh, they, they start painting on the ceramics. And so you have bowls and cups and, and all manner of ceramics that are bringing in this modernist and abstract painting, so much so that they ultimately drew in some of the great painters of their day who wanted to see what these women were doing and participate to the extent they could. A lot of the men would go on to become really famous for doing this. And this is at a time when Picasso was off in Europe doing the same exact thing. So basically the women of this workshop who were working from about uh, 1949 to 59 
had this explosion of the art form in what they were doing, but never got the credit. And so really for the first time as this excavation is happening, we're seeing all of this work brought together and just how prolific these women were, what they were doing, how they were pushing their art form forward. Uh, and so a lot of those pieces and a lot of the artworks and even to some extent murals have been brought to the Macmillan Museum of Art. My older daughter, when she was in single digits, uh, was begging to take a ceramics uh, course. <laughs> so how do you feel? I mean, I love ceramics. Do you, do, are you a ceramics I fan? I really, really, really so love ceramics, So do I. I don't know. Why, why do you th Why? I really am wildly into it. Why are you? For, for many reasons. Because one, you can appreciate form. I, I'm somebody who really loves texture. So Me with too. the glazing, I mean, sometimes it's really raw yeah. and sometimes it has you know this beautiful enamel and, and sheen to it also because you can paint it. So there are any means of, there are so many means of expression that can happen. By the way, I want to mention that while if you go to see the show while you're there, you should check out this new collection they have that was donated by Peter Lynch. Oh! Oh! Basically, was yeah. extremely generous, invited the museum in, and essentially let them choose whatever they wanted to have from his collection. So you see Sargent, you see Bierstadt, you see this, you see this uh, great. Uh, uh, a uh, sketch of Jacqueline Kennedy that would ultimately be for her White House portrait. It's oh. a really staggering collection. That's also on view right now. And again, it's free. For those of a certain age, and the name doesn't ring a bell, Peter Lynch was one of the all-time geniuses at Fidelity. Yes. Who, uh, uh, geniuses. And he was with us about the a year ago. Fund, wasn't it? I'm not sure which one. But and he was, Catholic schools. And he was with us lot. when he was yep. doing a huge amount of fundraising for the best of the Catholic uh, schools. So by the yeah. way, that exhibit of the uh, ceramicist. Is that a word, ceramicist? Yeah, it is, yeah. Ceramicist is uh, June 1st free at uh, BC. We have some uh, breaking news about the strappy little undergarment, the What's jockstrap. That? Well, Rebecca from uh, Boston texted text us, what and she we say? assume she's correct, yeah. that apropos of the strappy little jockstrap, the first sports bra was developed by women using a jockstrap to start. Oh. Wow. Wow. It's amazing. Did you know that, Jim? I did, yes. Now, <laughs> How much, uh, who doesn't? I mean, who doesn't? Who doesn't? Exactly. Now, how much, how long is that show of yours? Like an hour? Culture the culture show? show? You, have a, you have a big yeah. poster over there. Yeah, we have yeah. no poster. We don't have a by poster. Way. We've been here like 10 years. Personally. No poster. We don't have a poster. No, we are taking it personally. But you have a mug. What? I don't have a mug. No, we actually have three mugs, but okay. thank you very you much. Have, you have three mugs, I have no mugs. And another one may be well, coming. We're not saying yes or no. You're one not may be coming enough soon. To, to have a mug. I <laughs> no. mean, we have a smug mug. It's okay. legendary. So, other than, I assume. Smuggier with every mug. Thank you, Marjorie. I'm talking to Jared. Now, what was my point? Oh. It's an hour-long show. Other than, let's say, I don't know, the 20 minutes you're going to talk about jockstrap anniversary <laughs> today, what else are you doing on the uh, show? At I guess we'll have to move off the, the fashion yeah. wardrobe. So we're we're going to be what talking about the, the governor has just issued a new incentive to bring the... Uh, the cultural, the, 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 every, the force of culture into economic development. This is a charge Our governor? that the Healy Driscoll administration. What is she doing? Well, you'll learn more on the culture That's show. That's right. He doesn't know. In. He's going to find out by Don't two o'clock. Do you know? Jared. Of course I know. Okay. <laughs> of course I know. <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. I mean, no offense. You're there. He's the host, uh, Jim. He's the host. RuPaul has a new rainbow bus. That's I know. We be going south. That yep. is great, by the way. About bo yep. uh, books, book banning, and all. That's Except fabulous. What's up? There is a backlash over the last couple of about the last 24 hours about so RuPaul has also established a, a, a bookstore and a, basically a, a publishing arm and there's backlash we'll talk about why that has happened great and uh, what else and then this big debate about it's come up yet again about posthumy, posthumously publishing an author's work of art if they, they didn't want that to be published. Oh, yeah. that's, which is the artist? Can you tell us? Uh, we'll tell you at 2 o'clock. Tell us 2 o'clock. You know, by the way, Jamie raises a really good point. You have, how long has the show been around? Three months? Three months. And you have a banner. We have a banner. Where's our banner? You don't have one. Okay, and, he, you and have Jamie four, also mentioned four mugs the point. And I have no mugs. We don't even, we have three mugs so far. We don't even have a logo. And Jamie reminds me we had a logo. You have a logo. And they took it away. They took it away. They took our logo away. Oh, no. So we didn't have a logo. It's we have, gone. Let, me, let me review. We have no logo, <laughs> we have no banner. Uh, uh, we have been on the yeah. air, uh, whatever, 11 years. Yeah. No logo. Did you hear what I said? No yeah. logo, no banner. And you, who've been on the air about a week, have a, uh, a banner. I also have a sandwich in the case over there. That's you do. By the right. way, while there's always a Jim and Marjorie every day, you're eating it back there? How is it? Is it really or are you BSing? 
It's great. You have a, what is the Jared, for those who don't know? The, the, the spicy Jared. Sp- I'm sorry, spicy Please. Jared. Let's yes. get it right. That's redundant, if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. But go ahead. What is it? It's basically a buffalo chicken sandwich, but it's a really good buffalo chicken sandwich. Okay. Juice Feed Cafe, we love it. Everybody, check it out. The spicy Jared. Both the human variety and the sandwich variety. Nice to see you, Jared. Jared Bowen, thank you we'll very much. We'll be listening much. at 2 o'clock. If okay. you want the answer to all these questions that Jared refuses to tell us now, you must tune in right after the 2 o'clock news to listen to The Culture Show, which actually is a really fun it's show. Fabulous. Jared, it's congratulations. Yeah, really we have been speaking with GBH News Executive Arts Senator and Jared Bowen, who is also the host of The Culture Show, which airs daily at 2 o'clock on GBH 89.7. Thank you very much, Jared. After a quick break, Boston Globe business columnist Shirley Lee Ung on continued turmoil over at the world's greatest university. That, of course, would be Harvard University and non-compete clauses at, yes, Sam Adams Beer. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I'm Mark Regan and Jim Browdy live at the library. Streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News, facebook.com slash GBH News. We're at the library Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday every week starting this week. Tuesday, Michelle Wu, the mayor of Boston, joins us from 1 to 2. We're joined now by Boston Globe business columnist Shirley Leung. She also hosts the podcast Say More with Shirley Leung. It's fabulous, by the way. New episodes drop every Thursday. She joins us weekly. And Marjorie, I just learned she actually wanted to make a brief comment about... Jock straps. Thank you. Shirley, welcome, first of all. Nice to see you. Actually, I wanted to uh, give a shout out to Jared. Jared? Jared Bowen for Why? taking one for the team. Your producers have been pushing the jock strap story. <laughs> I, they said, Will you talk about it, Shirley? It's like, No, I'm not talking about the jock strap anniversary. So I want to thank Jared for taking well, one for the for team. Let's hear for Jared then. That's actually that's very noble. <laughs> I would say, I, I guess if it's, it's not business, it's culture. It's exactly. Business. It works. Thank yes. you it very works. Much. Yeah, that's right. So quite Shirley, a tribute, I should say. It is quite a tribute. So I would like to talk about jock straps, a stroppy little, what do they call it in that story? Stroppy little something or other. I thought it was a great description. But we have to move on to a serious matter. Yeah, I'm not talking jock. That's it. That's, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Uh, do you have anything you'd like to say about the State of the Union address last night, either President Biden or that weird woman from Alabama, the senator, Katie Britt? You know, uh, he, Biden, President Biden spent a lot of time talking about the economy yeah. and jobs, and it's really striking. I mean, he's, there's so many jobs that have been created uh, on his watch. 15 million, he says. Right, 15 million more than the first three years under Trump, um, 800,000 manufacturing jobs. Um, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's just, you know, pushed a lot of things that made us economically stronger. Inflation, inflation is under control, um, still high, um, but, but under control. So, so many good things, yet in the polls, Nobody gives him any credit, which yeah. is which is too bad. So I'm I'm glad that he really pushed 
uh, the economy. He, he took credit for it, what's, uh, how the economy is strong, even though a lot of people don't feel it, but it is strong. And then he also talked about taxes and about taxing the rich and taxing billionaires. A lot, a lot. Yes. And repeatedly he did, actually. Yeah. You know it's one of the biggest and things? And nobody, saying that nobody, as he promised as a candidate, nobody under $400,000 of income would pay an additional dollar You know, a couple of years ago, we were talking about people actually dying that were diabetic who couldn't afford right. their, their diabetes medicine. Yeah. Now it's 35 bucks for it senior citizens, and it, he's pushing to get it 35 bucks for everybody because people had to mm -hmm. ration uh, their insulin because it was so expensive. And he also talked about the cap of $2,000 tops right. on prescription drugs for right. a year. That is a huge, big deal. It is. I mean, talk about a pocketbook issue. Right, and he talked about getting, uh, reducing fees, mm -hmm. right, uh, yep. from, for, to $8. Um, so late I, fees on your uh, credit card. Yeah. Yeah. Credit cards and other kinds Which of Which is fees. also a big deal because <laughs> 32 bucks every time you're late. Lots of people are late because they're living paycheck to paycheck mm -hmm. off and they don't exactly have enough right. uh, money. At least we have some increased wages, but not enough increased wages. But in any case, he, you're right, he doesn't get any credit for any of that stuff. And uh, though, uh, like, me, uh, like many Americans, I was just waiting. I was like, is he old? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> He's and, old. And, and did he, would he sound old? How many gaffes we, would he make? But he, he was fired up was last strong. night. I think it was he really was good. Very, he was fired up, so I like that. He was very fired up and did not make a lot of mistakes last night. So huge win for Biden last night. I think so. We'll see how it plays out. So we're talking to Shirley Young. Shirley, I, I hadn't heard the term institutional neutrality until a couple of days ago, but apparently... After so many universities, particularly the University of Pennsylvania, my alma mater, and, and Harvard, at least the leaders, the former presidents, got in trouble, the new position that is being urged on virtually every university is institutional neutrality. Could you explain first what it is, and then let's talk about how the three of us feel about it. Right. So I actually have never heard of this term. Oh, good. But I remember when, you know, after October 7th and all these university leaders were taking positions and coming under drawing fire for how they were staking out their position on um, Israel Hamas, um, some university leaders were talking about this concept of why are university presidents weighing in? Why do they need to weigh in on um, Israel, Hamas, geopolitical events? Why do they need to weigh in on Russia, Ukraine? Um, you know, any number of, of hot button topics. And, um, and now what's happening, and, and including Harvard, they're studying the issue of maybe the university should remain neutral. Maybe, the, you know, in, in, in so in, in order so that there'll be more um, kind of open debate on, on issues. Well, you know, let me tell you, in the abstract when I read this, I say, well, this sounds, for about a second, like a common sense solution. And then I say to myself, because I don't know exactly what it means. So institutional neutrality, does that mean, for example, that when the murderous Vladimir Putin invades Ukraine and murders hundreds of thousands of people just trying to protect democracy. Harvard stays silent. I don't just mean Harvard, but Harvard's obviously. Does it mean uh, uh, after George Floyd X right. number of years ago, we don't speak about racism and racial... I, I just don't understand. Where's the line? I mean, I understand if there's a close question or there are credibly two sides, but that's a subjective decision too, which they want to avoid. Okay, maybe that makes sense, but on things where there isn't the second side, where there's a moral principle, like the two things I just mentioned, and I'm sure the three of us could mention another hundred of them, are they silent? I don't want to be associated with a university that doesn't feel the need to speak out on these kinds of things. No, that's the, that's the, the I guess, the controversy over being, in, you know, t taking a neutral stand, then you don't show moral leadership then as a, a university. And, and that's what students, kids, that's what they need to be taught. I mean, you know, when something is hor goes horrible or something horrible has happened, that you take a, uh, you have the courage to, to, um, to demonstrate And if you're neutral, you are, I would say if you're neutral, for example, about the invasion of Ukraine, then you are taking a position. You're saying mm -hmm. that it's not important enough that this murderous yeah. dictator is uh, uh, is on the march into a sovereign nation. So uh, again, in the abstract, fine. Let's see how this actually plays out and whether it's just an escape. I mean, I think what's really interesting is that uh, other than, I mean, for it, 
Israel Hamas has, has kind of been the breaking point on this issue. But, it has. But universities have weighed in on George Floyd. They have weighed in on Ukraine. And, um, or, or I don't know if they've weighed in, but they, they've done things on campus that show they support Ukraine and they don't And support, democracy, you know, right. I, I pardon my cynicism, but isn't this really all about the fact that billionaire and billionaire donors who are upset about anti-Semitism on campus say we're not going to give you any money? Isn't that really what this is all about you're right it's probably <laughs> that probably is that's the big difference yeah for, perhaps with compared to the other issues yeah uh, billionaire donors um think a lot of these university leaders were on the wrong side of history yeah. when they didn't um come to, come out and condemn more hamas more strongly yeah i'm talking and, to and shirley young business columnist for the boston globe so i i thought we had done away with a lot of these non-compete clauses in the commonwealth of massachusetts but um apparently at Boston Beer, you know, Jim Coke and Sam Adams, they, they, they still have them and, and Coke goes after people? Yes, I, this was a, a piece by my colleague Katie Johnston. Um, I was actually shocked so to have, because, um, so what, and sometimes it seems like Jim Coke um, would First personally. First of all, it's Coke. Is, is it co- it's, I think it's I think Coke. Yeah, Jim, yeah. Cook, yeah. Per, Jim Cook personally would call, uh, you know, a former employee, he's at another craft beer company, and say, hey, listen, like, you should not be working in this industry. You should be taking uh, the year off. And and um, in, in some cases, and, and they threaten uh, threatens to sue. In some cases, that former employee would get fired by his new employer. Um, I think the one in was it the, the West Coast was kind of even more outrageous. And this former employee, he had uh, moved to Seattle, or Oregon, or he moved out to the West Coast. Um, he wasn't even. It, it sounded like he wasn't even. I think he was like a sales rep, right? right and it's also a state that doesn't allow for non competes, right, and he, he apparently did not know that non non-competes were unenforceable in whatever state it was, Washington yeah, Oregon, state or Washington, something. Yeah. something. And then he, he was working at bars or something. He wasn't even working in... Like, no, he essentially thought this industry was right. going to be his life. Right. He's a young right. guy in his 20s, and he left the industry right. because of this. So, and by the way, so am I understand... The law? Well, exactly. I thought we passed... I did too. I remember when I was still writing columns for The Globe, writing about yoga teachers having to fight their non-compete things yeah. and they went from one yoga studio. What do they pay? Yoga teachers I mean, 75 seems, bucks a class right. or something? I mean, it seems like the law is, I mean, it's 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 watered down, but... It's, in Massachusetts. It's, in Massachusetts, but I think um, Jim Cook is Cook definitely... Is. Going, you know, you know, going after people and, and threatening, um, threatening lawsuits. And and what's what is good is that the employees, the former employees, are suing. They're they're suing. Well, let's see to, what happens. To to keep their jobs. Yeah. Well, I, 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 there's a lot of a lack of clarity here about which jobs are non compete Well, which can I also say one thing about this? I I, I I think I'm right about the law. If the concern is about trade secrets, that's well, different. if someone disclosed trade different. secrets. Then sue them right. for yeah. a violation. That it seems to me. But the whole notion that there's a blanket non-compete yeah. for a low to mid-level worker who's just yeah. getting started in the industry. They get your start with you, uh, meaning Boston Beer or whatever yeah. the formal name is, and they choose to. Right. It, that's just that, wrong. That, that that seemed outrageous. It wasn't like you know he was uh, these these employees were in the C-suite exactly, uh, and they were mixing. You know, exactly, like, they were mixing. They were figuring out the the you know Sam Adams beer. You know they were just you know in sales. You know they seemed like exactly mid-level executives, and yet they have to take a one-year timeout. We're talking to Shirley Young. So what's going on with the Revolution Soccer team? I guess they they had a big crowd down at Gillette. Um, uh, about this uh, New England Revolution and so forth. Are we going to get something going on here? Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you repeat that, please? Okay. So wait, wait, let me. Th- <laughs> I can't. Yeah. Don't. Don't. <laughs> I can only like, botch she, things twice. Where, oh, yeah. Where is she going with this? So yeah. we've talked about this before. A stadium, yes. right? At, at, how the 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 crafts we, yep. we also own the New England Revolutions. Uh, they've been long, maybe for t- 20 years now, right? Looking to build a stadium somewhere in Boston, in the Boston area. And the latest site is um, on the Everett waterfront. And um, there have been all these kind of shady backroom efforts uh, to stick, you know, a stadium on the Everett waterfront through. You know, legislation. Um, there haven't been any hearings or anything like that. But the latest is that there has been a bill formally filed on Beacon Hill, on Beacon Hill uh, for a professional soccer stadium and waterfront park. Um, and now I think there's hope that there will be a hearing 
Um, it, you know, if it, and because what happens is that the waterfront is designated for a port, so you need legislation to change the zoning. And um, I mean, there is a lot of opposition. I mean, there's there's there are people who support the 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 stadium. I think the mayor of Everett supports it. I think the Conservation Law Foundation, um, you know, is 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 upset that there's. This They're kind really of, unhappy. They're yeah. strongly, but, but I thought wasn't this the issue where Mayor Wu? said she was left out of community left, benefit discussions right. and it's on the Boston border or some such thing? Yes, or, yes. But I think this is good. I think this is good to have a bill filed, to have so a have public a hearing, yeah. have everyone debate. I mean, there, there's, you know, supporters, there's opponents, but it should be, there should be a transparent process. But it remains to be seen if there will actually be a hearing. It may not go anywhere. And by the way, so the notion would be this would actually be downtown, even though it's Everett, not Boston, but relatively close. And it would not be like a 65,000 seat stadium. I think I'm right about that. No, I think. A la uh, uh, Foxborough. It would be like a 35. Yeah, yeah, 20,000, 25,000. I mean, it's, it's not. I mean, well, I like, the I like the dedicated notion and having it downtown. Makes sense, but uh, this has been going on forever. So, right. what do you mean downtown? Downtown Boston? Well, no, Everett. Or, I mean, Everett is not oh, yes, like having yes. to travel to right, Foxborough exactly, kind exactly. of thing. Well, also, the, what's going on in Foxborough is that um, you know the the the, the soccer the. the they only take a portion. The revolution. Of the, yeah, they the revolution. They don't fill the stadium, so they want their own stadium. So, What's the Conservation Law Foundation upset about? Well, because it's waterfront property, and you're you're kind of willy nilly. Seems like you're making an exception to the rule okay. and what should go on the waterfront. All right. We should so, talk to them because my understand. I don't understand this, but what I read was there are a bunch of properties that have the same problem in terms of being developed, and they don't want to see one piece exactly. of property right. plucked out and right. the others, they want to dealt with in a more, uh, uh, a larger kind right. of so way. Right, so I don't yeah. think they're per, uh, well, they are per se against a soccer stadium, but it's, they're against the, the current process. So this is a really weird story by Sean Carter in The Globe, one of your colleagues, about this lawyer that was using AI-generated filings in a case involving a young woman who later committed suicide who alleges that she was uh, sexually abused by and groomed by police officers. Um, uh, and he's made his arguments using AI. Right, and, and it's not the first case in the country. Mm -hmm. This has been happening with lawyers. And so what happens is that lawyers use an AI software to generate, uh, you know, this is what's happened before, citing case laws. And then... Stoughton, I should have said this Stoughton, is local. This is the Stoughton, Stoughton, yeah, this is the, the, the fairly high-profile Stoughton case. And... Um, and then was and, and it turns out that all the the previous cases that was cited in this briefing, they were the the AI software just made them up. It was part of the hallucinations. But this has happened before. Um, lawyers, you know, use a software uh, to try to you know write a legal brief and. I don't know why you wouldn't check. It seems like you would. I think it's okay to use AI software, but you got to check, ch the, check facts. the facts. You yeah. have to check the software. By the way, you, you glossed over it too quickly. This guy cited three cases. Yeah. The judge just determined in good faith, he didn't cook the books, yeah. that don't exist. Right, they don't Three cases that allegedly supported his position right. that, don't, that never happened. Right, they, they were completely, they were hallucinations, completely made up. And, and, and I actually well, that's think... that's the word they use, hallucination yeah, is the that's term the, of art. That's, that's the, right. Uh, yeah, the AI, they, they call it the yeah. AI world. They said that, 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 um, that the software often makes hallucinations. That's why it, it can't really be rolled out. It shouldn't be rolled out in, in real... Or it should be, you can use it, you need How to weird check is it. that? That the, 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 the AI would generate made-up cases. Well, it's garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. The expression we heard about right. search engines 20 years ago. Right. But, that, mean, but, but they say made up. They're not saying mistaken cases. I mean, maybe I'm wrong in my well, understanding. Well, it's just the way the algorithm grabs information, yeah. and it's not perfected in it yet. And so it's up to humans. You still need a layer of humans to Thank check. Thank God. Marjorie, we you talk know? so much about misinformation on the Internet. Right. If AI grabs the misinformation and messes around with it and produces it for you. Well, it was just the way it was described. It was described as made up, not not like mistaken cases. Well, not by the lawyer not because by, the yeah. judge found right. specifically the lawyer, as you say, yeah. should have double checked, yeah. but not that the lawyer was participating in a scam. It, you know, speaking of that, can I just say one other thing about this which matters to me? A listener whose name I won't mention nor her company yet because I'm listening to a podcast she sent to me just yesterday from Newton has this company that's doing a lot of AI around legal research. And her contention, I have to say, I only listened to 15 of the 30 minutes yesterday, and I buy this based upon what I've heard, 
is AI will democratize and provide greater access to justice for low-income people yeah. who can't afford a lawyer, can't get a public defender, oh. can't, if they're representing themselves particularly. So again, I don't want right. to uh, mention the name of the firm yet until right. I finished, but I think we should maybe, is, assuming it's as legit as it sounds and as helpful as it sounds, well, considering that almost 90% right. of people who need a lawyer can't find one. And by the way, I assume most people know, while in criminal cases, if your freedom's at risk, you're entitled to a lawyer under the Constitution. In civil. in civil cases, no matter how serious the consequences, you're not entitled to a lawyer. Well, and it would save, I would think, enormous amounts of time. Right. It's yes. much, you, you wouldn't have to write the thing yourself. Right. Well, I that's mean, why, and a lot cheaper, which yeah. means, yeah, go ahead. But it's not just in the legal world. I mean, even in journalism, you know, I use AI, you know, if, if I, you know, if I, I use ChatGPT, it's like, oh, I'm having trouble with looking for a word or a phrasing, mm -hmm. you know, I'll just put it in, just see what it says. I mean, I don't cut and paste, but I, it, it kind of sparks some, you know, some ideas. I mean, there were some thing. hallucinations in your recent right. column, I meant to tell you. <laughs> I mean, actually. same thing, like, think about with head, writing headlines, mm -hmm. right? You could, so, like, I'm, I, I have this story. Um, That's and actually great. In the that Boston is, because it's hard yeah. to write you, headlines. Jen, give me some ideas for headlines, and it's, it's, they can do it in nanoseconds. And By the way, some of the cleverest with. people in the newspaper business, none of whose names we know, other than people like you who work in the business, are the headline writers. I mean, well, good I know, headlines I know are one, just, yeah. my old boss right. from the Herald. Who? Ken Chandler. Yeah. Headless oh. body in t found in, in topless, topless bar. bar. <laughs> One of the best Wait, what, ever. Say, say it again. Headless, headless body found oh, in topless good. bar. That's yeah, really I good. I think he may have other people. He was at the, he used to be at the New York Post. He was a Murdoch yeah. guy, um, but, he, but he was one of the people that was involved in that great headline. So the thing that surprised me the most was the fine. Is, is $2,000 didn't seem much of a fine? Uh, I don't, well, they say it wasn't intentional, so maybe, oh, and they close. So I don't know. So what are you doing on that great podcast of yours? Oh, this was such a fun week. We had... Um, uh, Kenji Lopez Alt, New York I'm a Times. Fan, oh, by the, the way. cooking I'm a big fan. Yeah. Yes, he um, actually went to MIT and uh, trained in a lot of the mm -hmm. the restaurants here. Uh, and he's a cookbook author now. He's on YouTube. Uh, and then also Deborah Perlman, the founder of Smitten Kitchen. Uh, the two of them have teamed up to do a new podcast called The Recipe. Um, and so we had the two of them on. Uh, I had the two of them on talking about um, home cooking. Um, I mean, they were kind of like the super heroes to home cooks everywhere and it was really fun because both of them have kids you know some of the same age I think Kenji's kids are a little younger than mine um, and uh, we talked about and it has cooking has has becoming you know a parent changed the way they cook you oh. know and um, and so uh, and I know for me it has like I for some reason like my oldest is 13 years for some reason once I had kids I stopped using raw meat I stopped cooking with raw meat why <laughs> because it was, I didn't want to clean up I mean my husband does the, most of the cooking in the household but I'm like I'm just gonna go to Trader Joe's I'm gonna get the frozen chicken it's already pre cooked you know and stir fry and I'm done I do. I, I love to bake. Yeah, I love to bake, but I don't touch raw meat anymore. Yeah. I don't have time for it. But the good news for your kids, I have to say, in all fairness, is in light of the fact that they wanted a no vote in Milton, yes. and which will mean their inheritance will not be negatively affected, <laughs> exactly. they can hire cooks when they're grown <laughs> exactly. up. Exactly. So that, everything works out for the yeah, best. Exactly. By the way, very quickly, is Mil I, I should have read about that. Is Milton in the process of re doing something that'll pass muster or no? I don't think so. Is I th that true? I think there are people on the planning board who, who want to fight. And, want to um, fight uh, Campbell, the Attorney General's yes, lawsuit? Yes, they want to fight. I think, they're, I think many are still very upset about being classified a rapid transit community based on the, you know, Mattapan trolley, which is a, a joke of a... The cheese. You know, we got a, a lecture a the other night, trolley. Marjorie and I had dinner by we an did. unnamed yes voter, by the uh -huh. way. Oh. Who uh, well, I won't I should have brought it up. In any case, you uh, brought it up. Jim. You always, next time you're here, can wait, we wait? Wait, why were you lectured on what? What do you mean? Uh, well, I can't tell you right now. I shouldn't okay, have brought okay, up. One more thing. But can you oh, yeah. for next week? Can you get an update oh, yeah, get an and update. we'll talk about so, it? Yeah. So it's so funny because I have a, you know a lot of us uh, from the Globe. We we live in Milton. I mean because back, I know that. because the. Globe, Globe used the to be right next to right, Milton. Right, used to be on Dor Dorchester. Morrissey Boulevard, Dorchester. Yes. So a lot of us live in Milton. And um, even though our headquarters are now downtown, we still live in Milton. And um, the other day, my 11-year-old my comes home and says, um, oh, you know, uh, the, the, there, there's, a, there's a fundraiser uh, at, you know, one of the local restaurants, you know, for the Milton Education Foundation. It's like, Mom, do you want to go? It's like a book swap. You can drink, whatever, and raise money for a good cause. 
and I was like, there is no way I'm going. I do not want to talk to my neighbors and friends. I don't want them to come up to me to talk about the yes vote, no vote. But one of my colleagues went, and guess and? what happened? She was she was confronted. She was she was confronted at the, the at the fundraiser. You know how could the Globe support? You know uh, you know the the yes side. Like what's wrong? Who with was you? it? I can't say. Okay. <laughs> but anyways, this is why I was just like I have to keep a low profile now. Well, no, you did yeah, the right my, thing my in our estimation. Business, yes I'm vote. A, I'm a yes vote, but I, I get to keep my. We would have been yes votes too had we lived there. Shirley Young, it's great to see you. Next week we'll get another thank, thank you. Thank you very much. We've been speaking with Shirley Young, Boston Globe business columnist, weekly BPR contributor, and host of the podcast, Say More, with Shirley Young. It's a great Shirley podcast. Young, available wherever you get your podcast. Shirley, thank you very much. After a quick break, we're going to talk with Michael Curry from the NAACP and the Mass League of Community Health Centers. We're going to talk to him about why, with the opioid crisis and deaths from opioid addiction still, or overdoses still spiraling, spiraling out of control, when there are drugs that will help that situation, why these drugs are still so hard to get. Plus, some breaking news on the mess at Stewart Healthcare. Michael Curry is next. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com uh, slash GBH News and facebook.com slash GBH News. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Marjorie live at the library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News, facebook.com slash GBH News. Next Tuesday, which is our next day here, the mayor will join us for an hour from 1 to 2. We're joined now by Michael Curry. Michael's the president and CEO of the Mass League of Community Health Centers. He's also a member of the National NAACP Board of Directors, where he chairs the board's advocacy and policy committee. Hello, Michael. Hello, Hello Michael. Good to see you. Great to see you. I, I enjoyed my walkover. You walked you did? over? I did. From walk where? From uh, City Hall area. Wow. It's like four blocks. That's but, not something but, to brag but about. I'm closing my circles, so oh, okay, I'm, I'm making fine. progress. Oh, I'm very <laughs> okay. impressed. And, it's, and uh, you know, I guess it's, it's warm out. Warm well, it's than it not should that warm, be. but it's beautiful. Well, exactly. it's warmer than yeah. it should be. Okay. Anyway, uh, Michael, uh, before we get to other health care stories and et cetera, uh, did you watch the State of the Union last I, night? I did, which is why what? I have bags under my eyes. <laughs> and I watched the Republican response. That oh was a hell of a response. Yep. Oh, my God. Jim has been doing a very bad imitation of that woman all morning long. But, but uh, what did you think? Um, one, I, I think, again, and all the pundits have said this, that um, people knew, need to know that he had a pulse uh, and he had energy and he was passionate. Uh, and it was much more of a political speech. But I would argue anybody who watched Donald Trump's State of the Union streets, they were political speeches, yep. too. Um, so the reality is, is uh, the Democratic Party and maybe some independents needed to hear that from him. They needed that energy, that passion. And then he responded to some critical issues like the war in the Middle East or Ukraine funding or um, uh, the border crisis. Yep. Um, and I thought pretty, pretty um, outstanding that he actually turned and, and pointed to the Supreme Court. I love Wasn't that. Wasn't that great? <laughs> I, love I love that. Respectfully. He said respectfully. respectfully. And he was respectful. Yeah. Respectfully. And I, and I thought the, the foreshadowing that he said, which is that, uh, you know, you will hear the women's voice in this country was pretty um, powerful. I love that part Okay, let's too. skip Katie Britt, the senator from Alabama. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Michael, I believe last year... It, it, 
last year was the record number of opioid deaths in Massachusetts, was yeah. it not? So the problem is not going away. There was a story, I think, in the Globe about how in the two biggest cities in New Hampshire, uh, uh, opioid deaths are dropping precipitously. And while there is no conclusive, uh, there's no uh, certain conclusion, the best guess, educated guess, is that Narcan is so readily available and it's doing a wonderful job. Yep. And then you come back to Massachusetts, and I was under the impression that there was a requirement that the whatever the makeup of Narcan or Narcan itself be available at every pharmacy in Massachusetts. And I read on a few paragraphs to say that's the law, but it's being honored in the breach. It's not available in a tons of play. Where's the disconnect? Why is this happening? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's as we have a broader conversation around harm reduction, right? Needle exchanges, uh, safe consumption sites, um, these uh, strategies to provide you with uh, methadone or buprenorphine or suboxone, as people are more familiar with, as life-saving strategies. We know that people who have addictions have a disease, right? So let's get out of the stigma that it is something that people choose to do, right? When you are addicted to a drug, um, we have a responsibility as a medical community to meet your needs and address your, your crisis. The problem is that some more, of the more liberal, more progressive states are embracing these life-saving measures. And even in Massachusetts, more liberal Massachusetts than the rest of the country, we're slow to do it because we're still stuck in ancient times. We blame people for having a disease where we feel like, uh, I don't want to contribute to your vice instead of understanding that this is about the 80,000 deaths a year and overdose. And if I can save your life to then get you the treatment, to then get you healthy and back with your families and back to in your communities, that's the ultimate goal. But I still don't, I, I, you know, if there was no law, I could understand. I wouldn't be happy by the antiquated views about what addiction is. But this is the law in Massachusetts that's not being honored. So is it just not being enforced? Is there, I mean... Yeah, I think it's a, it's an, a slow uptake. So in Massachusetts, we are uh, leaps and bounds. You know, I remember, and I, I've talked about both of you about this before, even Marty Walsh, when he did his travel to Canada, look at safe consumption sites yeah. as an example. That was relatively recent. <laughs> so even in Massachusetts, with uh, governors uh, Baker to now Governor Healy and mayors and city managers, town managers, we're just turning the corner. So yes, some of it is law, some of it is regulation. How do we open it up? Do we have vending machines? That's the, the next uh -huh. conversation that have life-saving tools available. So if somebody in the library right now had an overdose, yeah. do we have what we need here, like a, 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 a heart machine? to get your heart pumping again, but the, the right interventions to get you uh, to survive that uh, overdose. Well, everybody should have Narcan in their glove compartment, it seems to me, but that's for another day. Briefly, can we talk, touch on one other addiction issue that I'd like you to try to explain? Uh, uh, people know who listen to the show, I am wildly against state-sponsored gambling. I know it raises a lot of money for good things. I don't like it at all. We spend more per capita on the lottery than any state in America by far. We spend $91 a month per capita, 91 a month on online uh, betting, sports betting and that sort of thing. Healy and her budget, I don't, this is what I don't understand at all. The amount of ad money is doubling, which means more enticing to people. And the amount of money that goes to the addiction prevention or solution cure uh, programs is being cut in half. It seems to me both things are going in the wrong direction. What am, am I missing something? No, you're not. And I think there's a few things to remember. So one is I would tell people to relax. It's just the governor's budget. <laughs> so this is a long process. And it starts with the governor's budget and then both chambers over the next few months will release their budgets and there's some reconciliation that goes back and forth. Um, and, and I mentioned this before, I used to say that there's a, uh, there used to be a tool on the state's website where you could play legislator for a day, right? You could sign on, and then you'd have to figure out what I revenue didn't to raise. That. I didn't either. Yeah, it was a fascinating tool. It was, so even as you sit here now and you decide whether you want to raise the gas tax or reduce the sales tax in order to fund a program, a service, um, to get people raises and benefits and the group insurance commission, so federal employee, I mean state employees, You'd find yourself all tied up in knots making these difficult decisions. That doesn't mean that there's not a problem with that reduction, though. What it means is that when people make those decisions in, a, in, a, in the towers of the governor's office, ANF, Administration of Finance, then we get to react to it. Then we can say, no, that's going to lead to more people dying, or that's going to be less housing and more uh, uh, vice and more um, people stuck in hospitals, right? We respond to it. And then they calibrate their, their projections around the budget and the House and Senate take our advice into consideration. And then m 
more often than not, we end up in a better place by June, July when a budget is passed. So just understanding that, no, it doesn't make sense. It, it is absolute problem. I use the cessation planning, uh, cessation uh, programs as an example. Smoking. My mother was a longtime smoker. I never thought she would give up smoking. And then she had the patches and she had all these programs and it allowed her to have to step down in nicotine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And my mother has been off cigarettes for probably a good 30 plus years. I never would have, I mean, she smoked so many cigarettes a day, it was ridiculous. So really what we're talking about is addiction, uh, gambling addiction, you've got to invest in support services so that people can get off. So I, I love the notion that somebody is in the casino who notices that you're er there every day, that notices you may be addicted, who will walk over to you and get you in a program to then get you to a better place. That is, we need to fund that. That program was defunded in this budget, right. as you know, so hopefully right. it'll go back. We'll talk to the governor about it when she's with us too. Very briefly, before we get back to some issues relating to the organization you're on the board of, one of your neighborhood health centers that we've talked to you about, Eat Boston Neighborhood Health Center, I think is doing sort of what GBH did. We used to be WGBH. <laughs> we dropped the W. I'm not going to tell why. Figure it out. If not, maybe next week. I still week. throw the W in sometimes. Uh, well, okay, we'll never do that so again, I. Michael Carey. <laughs> why is bad. East Boston Neighborhood Health Center, which is a pretty celebrated place from yep. what I understand, why are they changing their name? So people don't know this history, but health centers launched in Massachusetts uh, in, a in 1965. The first health center was in Columbia Point. Um, and we usually tied a lot of these health centers to the neighborhood, right? So if they, we say in the health centers, if you've seen one health center, you've seen one health center. East <laughs> Boston's not Mattapan, is not Lowell, is not Lawrence, is not um, Springfield. And they were very much neighborhood. That's why we called them originally neighborhood health centers, not community health centers. Yeah. And what East Boston and Greg, who's a, a great friend and a phenomenal leader, has decided to do is to take the neighborhood out of it and really tie East Boston to South End because now they've grown. They're in Roxbury. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so okay. they've actually had sev okay. several satellite sites. And many health centers are not relegated to one neighborhood now. They're serving the greater area of their communities. And what he said is it's about the patients. It's about our staff. It's about the community. And we want to have a, a global way to describe that so that all people feel like care is here. And not just because it's East Boston, but because it's uh, the health center uh, that's serving them. And I think that's phenomenal. Uh, we celebrate that, and I'll be uh, with him later this week. Or Neighborhood week. Health Center is what it's now going to be called? Neighborhood Health. Okay, Neighborhood fair enough. Health. We're talking, talking to Michael, Michael Curry, President CEO of the Mass League Community Health Centers and a member of the National NAACP Board of Directors. One last health care thing. We've all been reading about Stewart Healthcare, their financial problems. Yeah. I've really enjoyed Brian McGroy's columns about the 190-foot yacht and the 98-foot <laughs> fishing boat uh, owned by the guy who's made millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, off a hospital system where they've had to have medical equipment repossessed because they're not paying their bills. Yeah. Well, now um, people are wondering what's going to happen to all these hospitals. Well, now this just broke today in the Globe that Stewart's uh, St. Anne's Hospital um, gets potential buyer by South Coast Health. We don't know that much about this, I don't think yet, yeah. but is this a good thing from what we think or do we not know or what? So, so it's Fall River, by the way. So it's expected, right? So we know of the seven hospitals um, that are in question. Uh, Stewart has to decide which ones to close and then which ones are viable to be sold and acquired. So I'm going to preface this when I say this. I've been in calls with uh, the governor's office, with the secretary of health and human services, with other administration officials to say, if you do that in a room, don't forget about community, right? Because oftentimes these things are done and negotiated in the back room and community is not involved, right? Because yeah. there are implications on community from a community health center perspective. If you, if you close Kearney Hospital, those people now are coming into community health centers and other organizations looking for care. It's going to overwhelm our ER room. If you're sitting here right now and you go to emergency room, you're going to wait four or five hours for something that could take 15, 20 minutes to care for. Um, imagine that exacerbated by closures of yeah. these for-profit entities. So there are implications to this. From a community health center perspective, if you acquire some of these facilities, it could lead to the siphoning off of our patients that we rely on for our patient revenue. It could, rely, it could result in the siphoning off of our providers that we are already struggling in the pecking order. We can't pay them as much benefits, give them as much benefits. We can't pay them sign on bonuses like the bigger systems. So one is that. Two, yes, this makes sense. St. Anne's, South Coast, strong, strong financial standing for South Coast and their affi affiliated hospitals. Um, it is Saint, uh, this Stewart Hospital site is one of the more profitable ones. So it makes sense that if you're going to acquire a hospital, it needs to be one that's financially viable. I think they're somewhere just south of $50 million a year in net uh, profit. Um, it's, a, it's a smart deal. And you sustain uh, care. Um, you can uh, minimize disruption. 
um, and make sure that there's access main, remaining in those communities. But the deal has to be done. It's still complicated because they, they won't own the buildings. Right? So oh. part of your deal is when you, if I negotiate to take over your hospital, I get your patients, I get your debt, I get all those things. I'd like to own your building too so that I can keep my costs down. That's the part that needs to be worked out. They sold it and yeah. rented it back, which is part of their Was reason it, what, they're in financial trouble. Yeah. yeah. Why do they have to? You can't negotiate without giving them the buildings, too? Well, it's no longer a steward owned right? So now yeah. that brings in another party to negotiate yeah. with, and then that's, you know, for It's like profit. buying the Patriots. You want the stadium that goes, I mean, the property right. is of right. huge value, and that's yeah. one of the reasons that Crafts did it. You know, Michael, we wanted to talk to you. We're not going to have time today to talk about the uh, Urban League study of the state of black America, yeah. except to say, and we'll do this next week with you, that uh, for those who think uh, Massachusetts is immune to the continuing inequities that are pointed out in the state of black America by the Urban League, they're wrong, as you can describe next week. But yeah. one specific thing here that was really troubling that we oh. read about this morning is this what's going on that the NAACP is involved in the Southwick schools? Could you give us a, a quick summary of what the hell's going on there? Yeah, I mean, um, my understanding, and I haven't had a chance, I'm, I was until recently, until last week, I was the administrator for all the NAACPs, one of the many jobs I had. You were? I was the administrator for all the NAACPs in the region uh, for the last four years, three and a half years. Um, and I gave up that position because I had too much to do. That being said, um, that issue is a pretty uh, disturbing one. Right outside of Springfield, um, young people thought that it was okay to have a slave auction and to the students, students, and to create these values around the black students in the school. And um, quite frankly, it uh, shocks the conscience, if I say from a legal term that we say all the time, that any student, that any person would think that's okay in 2024, 2023. And that people still be believe that that's uh, acceptable. Now, the problem becomes how adults respond to it. What is the punishment, the penalty for those students? What's the engagement of those families and those parents? What's the uh, uh, support and services that are provided to those students that were being so-called auctioned off? Um, and what is the opportunity that we create in this movement to raise people's consciousness about slavery, about the dehumanization and murder and death of slavery and the devaluing of black life? to $15 or $20 in slavery, and then 2024. So do we know the answers to any of those questions yet or no? I think they're being asked. I think the okay, president okay. of the Springfield NAACP okay. and others are demanding that there be a response. And we okay. also should point out that it was also, you know, it, kids, parents were talking about, their, uh, you know, their kids being harassed and bullied, teachers of color, talking about racial discrimination in the district, alumni talked about it. Um, this woman got up and talked about her own daughter being uh, racially bullied, excoriating school officials for allowing eight of the ten students who participated in the slave auction to come back to school after the incident when she said her own daughter uh, stayed home for three weeks. So there's a lot of, of real, like, demented racism going on. It there. is. But, I mean, again, you know, we like to look for shiny objects. People will be shocked by the story. Yeah. But I can tell you as an NAACP longtime leader, former Boston president, national board, I investigate these cases uh, when they come up. And the reality is this is not isolated. Um, adults and, and young people do this all the time across the country because they go home to neighborhoods and schools where um, racism festers, especially post Donald Trump's first election. Uh, you know, people like to believe that it's um, an isolated thing. Yeah. He unmasked America. Right? He took the, 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 the sheets off to realize that hate and racial animus exists everywhere in this country, and people just didn't have a, 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 a platform to espouse those views, now they do. Well, the other thing is we like to think in Massachusetts that it happens in those places. Southwick is in Massachusetts, and we'll continue to talk about it. You know, Michael, you've been kind enough, off and on every couple of weeks with us, to give us a little piece of uh, black history. And uh, what you chose to spend a couple of minutes on today relates to the building that we were all looking at uh, last night as we were watching Biden and, well, Katie Britt was in her kitchen, forget that. So uh, share with us what uh, you're gonna share with us here, Michael Curry. Well, I'm gonna split it up because I'm gonna actually try to do more in the second piece that I talked to you about okay. doing today, which is the color of law. And I thought about it because Katie Britt uh, irritated the heck out of me listening to her <laughs> last night. <laughs> Um, and of course, Katie Britt, the Republican from Alabama, and this whole notion that she invited people in her kitchen to have a conversation about how um, America is heading the wrong direction and, and we don't have a commander in chief. Um, 
and that um, this notion that her family and communities can pull themselves up and they can make a better lives for themselves. I, I know for all of us who know history and who are African Americans in this country, I, get, I, I choke up at listening to people say that because they don't know this history of this country. So the color of law, I teach just down the street at New England School of Law. I teach a diversity and inclusion in a law class. And I'm gonna encourage everyone who listens to your show, again, as I have before, to, to read the book, The Color of Law. Richard yeah. Rothstein's book. It, 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 let's say for every listener of yours, it's required reading now. Okay. Right? Including um, us. That's us. Awesome. We have to read this, Jim. <laughs> you didn't know I was giving out required no. reading to your listeners. It's required reading, but I want to tell you a little bit about the book. So, Color of Law argues that racial, race, re, racial residential segregation, the fact that some neighborhoods are almost exclusively African American while others are almost exclusively white, is a result of explicit government policy rather than personal choice. We like, oh, they want to live together. They love to live together. That's just what happens naturally. He debunks that myth. In other words, racial segregation in the United States is de jure, legal term, meaning by the law, meaning law segregated America, uh, versus de facto, which means by virtue of personal choices or random circumstances. I want to just give you a quick preview. Public housing is segregated, public housing as a segregating agent from most of this country's history. So one of the most important methods of which government segregated cities was the construction of segregated public housing. Projects, we call them. I grew up in Lenox Street housing mm. projects from World War I through the 1960s and 70s. By confining African Americans to subpar public housing in undesirable neighborhoods, uh, federal, state, and local authorities promoted, one, the segregation of their cities, and two, the transformation of predominantly black areas into slums or ghettos. So if I send you to neighborhoods where the facilities aren't up, uh, kept up, where uh, environmental is un unsafe, where I'm not gonna send police to, and services to, and all those other things, I create ghettos and slums. We ghettoize communities in this country. Projects were segregated by this matter of policy. For example, they had to abide by what we call the neighborhood composition rule. That is, they had to reflect the racial composition of the neighborhood around them. So that's a game, right? Is that I wanna make sure that everybody in Marjorie's neighborhood looks like Marjorie, and everybody in Michael's neighborhood looks like Michael. Now, the, the whole notion that this was all choice is a myth. Zoning was a racial construct that we use, or a construct used, oh. to segregate communities. We sent black people to communities, and we zoned them for them to live in. And we said, okay, you know what? We'll put industrial uh, factories near their houses, but we won't put it near white communities' houses, right? Think about how, I love that phrase, and I've said it before, if you're not at the table, you're on the table, or you're on the menu. So when you're the zoning board, and you're the lawyer, the judges, and you're the city officials, and that's what most of our country's history was, then I don't really care what happens to you and your communities. Yeah. I want value. One last thing I'll say about that, and I want you to read the book. The violence that was perpetrated when black families try to move into white neighborhoods, police was complicit in that violence for most of this country's history. That means they let you bomb the house. That means they let you run them out of the house. If I were a black family and I have, I have you know, I'm building greater wealth because I'm a CEO, I'm making more money, I'm gonna tell you if I could go back in time, I would say I wanna live in Newton. But the way this worked back in the day, there'd be the restrictive covenants that said you can't buy that house because for much of this country's history. Or there's this thing called blockbusting, the game that real estate agents play. They basically say everybody who looks in like Jim's neighborhood looks like Jim, Michael wants to move in, so they, they allow me to move in, but then they run around and tell everybody else, your neighborhood's going to hell, um, it's gonna be a slum, because the black family moved in. So what do they get? They get the top value from me, because I'm so anxious to live in that white community, I'm gonna play top dollar, so I'm actually driving values up. Then they're gonna make you buy at low rates, or, or sell at a so lower cost, you get to all move out, and then more black families move in, and we pay exorbitant amounts for those same homes, called blockbuster. This is our history. So if we want to think about Roxbury and Dorchester and Mattapan and Lynn and Springfield and Lawrence, we got to come with a different construct on how this stuff happened. And then it'll make sense why the wealth gap, why people have a certain neighborhood constructs, why zoning is the way it is, why we don't, as uh, Shirley and I were just talking, why there's no liquor licenses in some communities. All of that is a part of this book. Well, you know, you mentioned blockbusting. We talked to Andrew Cabral about a Zillow study, which I'm sure you saw, is that even if one is able to buy into the community of choice, uh, they did research that showed that 
black home, homes owned by black or Latino families that are comparable are valued at 18% yeah. less yes. for black families, 14% yes. less for Latino families, then for devaluation, yep. than for white families. And so even know, if you're able to buy a house, which is one of the fundamental ways to help close the wealth gap, they undervalue that which you were able to purchase. And I want to stress again, government action yeah. versus personal choice. <laughs> this was government at every level, complicit really arguably through the 1970s and 80s. Remember, Boston NAACP sued Boston Housing Authority for steering white families into certain housing projects and black families into certain, like, Lenox Street housing project I grew up in, and they steer white families to Old Colony. Well, remember, remember the brouhaha when Ray Flynn, the, the stink when he was the mayor, when they were trying to put black families in, in projects in South yes. Boston? You would have thought... I mean, it was like the Civil War. It wasn't that over. long ago either. It wasn't, it wasn't that, that long. long ago. Historical minute ago, I call it. Yeah. It was. So, can we save the second half of this for yes. next week? We'd love to. Michael, Michael Curry, that was fabulous. Thank As you are very you. Much. It's great thank to you. see you. Thank Thanks you. so much for your thank time. You, thank you. Always we, a pleasure. We have been Always speaking, happy to have you. Uh, with Michael Curry, he's president and CEO of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers and a member of the National NAACP Board of Directors, where he chairs the board's advocacy and policy committee. Michael, thank you very, very great much. Great to see you, Michael. Thank you. After a quick break, switching to something that really matters here, Arby's roast beef. <laughs> Did you know <laughs> there's going to be a big protest because an Arby's roast beef is moving and the, there's going to be 500 people showing up to protest that they can't have an Arby's roast beef next to them in their hometown. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We're going to ask you, is an Arby's roast beef sandwich really worth all this consternation? That's next on Boston Public Radio. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. We're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News, facebook.com slash GBH News. Next Tuesday, we're here. Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. Tuesday, the mayor joins us, Michelle Wu, for Ask the Mayor from 1 to 2. Before we get to the topic at hand, you know, that protest in Canada where people traveled 100 miles, 500 people to protest because <laughs> they didn't have an Arby's in their neighborhood. We want to know what's the equivalent of an Arby's that you protest uh -huh. for. You know, we're getting a lot of uh, communication from people about something happened earlier in the show and what? I just want to address it. What? Well, we had these incredible opera singers oh, yes. who were head of a uh, part of White Snake uh, projects. Yep. And Marjorie, out of the blue, decided to make a comparison between the uh, uh, opera singers who were extraordinary. They were absolutely extraordinary. And a very good personal friend of ours <laughs> who happens to be one of the most famous singer-songwriters in the history of the United States, <laughs> a good friend of ours, Tom Rush. So here's a little bit. This is by, back by popular demand. Here's a little bit of what of Marjorie, and then she said this repeatedly, not just once. Here's a little bit of what Marjorie had to say. Here it is. You know, you're, you, very few people have these kind of voices. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, 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 we saw Tom Rush last week. We had him on here, and Tom Rush is fine, but I mean, he's <laughs> fine. <laughs> He's very fine. talented. He's a very talented singer, but you know he's what I'm saying? He's a folk singer. But he's it, not an opera a, singer. I know, but I mean, but I mean, there's one thing to be able to be a folk singer. I mean, I could practically be a folk singer. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So let me just summarize if I can, because it was said repeatedly. So Tom Rush, okay. arguably one of the what, most did you famous. Call you up? No, excuse me. Can I speak or not? Yeah, we, Our, Jim, Tom Rush, one of the most famous singer-songwriters of our time. Checking my text messages. He is quote fine as far as that. Mm -hmm. And 
anybody can pick up a guitar <laughs> and be a folk singer. So I just wanted to clear the... Oh, wait a second. One more thing about... Oh, I yeah, believe we have okay. a caller. We rarely take callers at this time. I don't know who you are. Welcome to the show. You're listening to Boston Public Radio. Oh, Welcome. Geez. Who's this? Marjorie. <laughs> Tom Rush. Oh, you're oh, Tom Rush. Oh, my God. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. You're, I, I hear you don't like my... Singing. No, I didn't say I didn't like your singing for once. I had to defend myself. You said he was now. fine. You said he was fine. I was saying that p- opera singers, I think, are born with a certain yeah. voice. Yeah. And what about and, Tom Rush? And, well, I think Tom. He Rush was my is idol too. when I was in college. But I think, I think, generally speaking, it's harder to be an opera singer than it is to be. Okay, a fine. Singer, How but, do you feel about that, Tom I, Rush? I, I, you know, Can I we was hear there, from Tom, Tom Rush. I was there, Tom. I hope. Nice at, try, Marjorie. Can we hear from Tom I Rush? I saw you. you he saw called. Me. What yeah. do you think of this, Tom? <laughs> How well do they play the guitar? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fine point. And they haven't written any songs either. You know, there's no, uh, there's no, no regrets uh, yeah. on their repertoire. So, Search for God. Yeah, whatever. okay, okay. So, so you so, fi- Rick, Go ahead. I, I sent Marjorie and Jim each a CD of my, I got a brand new CD out. I, I do, sent them yeah. each a copy of the CD. And then I had to send them each a CD player. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> he did, he did. It it's like a one That's stop. Right. That's right. And, and, and you know what else? They don't tell stories like you either, Tom. Yeah, good yeah. try, Marjorie. Yeah. A little late. <laughs> okay, so let me just say, and Tom, it's great to hear your voice. And if you too believe Tom Rush is fine, and, if, uh, and he's fairly good at playing the guitar, and he's a fairly good songwriter, yeah. he is doing a wonderful benefit tonight for one of the, my favorite places on the planet, the Pine Street Inn. He's doing it at the Boston City Winery. Go to Tom Rush. Dot com, and there are only a few tickets left. You can get them. Any final thing you want to say to Tom Rush? Okay. I hope you, I hope you don't hate me, Tom Rush. <laughs> <laughs> I never hate Marjorie. Okay. Because I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan, and I had a wonderful time down at the Narrows yeah. a couple of weeks Tom, ago. Tom, let me just say, I've always said about you for all the years I've... Well, I only met you a few years ago, but when I used to really idolize you, you are really fine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the fine Tom Rush, thank you for calling in, and I hope you'll you all go part, see him tonight. You, you missed the part, Tom, about how I said that my roommate and I had your poster on the wall in our freshman What did you want to say there, Tom? You missed that part. I, I'm, I just want to say, Jim, you're great, and Marjorie, you're not bad. <laughs> thank you. No, that, that's, I'll take it. I think that's an honest reaction from a fine folk singer. Tonight at the Boston City Winery, okay. TomRush.com. Tom, thanks for calling in. We, uh, we appreciate that. Uh, Tom, <laughs> look at Marjorie. So we have almost no time. If you want to weigh in on this thing, let me explain the situation to you without reading through the, in, uh, the uh, uh, intro because we don't have time. 527 people participated in some fashion in a protest 100 miles away from where they lived in Toronto because Arby's closed all their stores in Toronto and they were willing to pick up their stuff, go 100 miles, protest in another Arby's to convince the people that they should reopen a store in Toronto. So in our few remaining minutes at 877-301-81... Oops, sorry, the protest is tomorrow. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, 527 people say they're going to participate tomorrow or more now by now is there a thing that you don't have in your community a restaurant a fast food a place you really loved or would love to have that you don't have in your community that you'd be willing to travel 100 miles for a protest for is that clear i think so 877-301-8970 you can call or text we have very few minutes uh, uh, well, 877 Before we get to Arby's Roast Beef, I want to point out that uh, uh, people are very disappointed. At least this one texter is saying, did I miss the moldy chestnut discussion of daylight saving time and the necessity for little minor hats mm-hmm. for little kids waiting for the bus in the Because it's dark in the morning. What is going on? Did they miss it? Uh, well, no. I think that we're When will that be? Monday. Monday. Monday Daylight night. saving Bold time. Out, chestnut, we're dragging Sunday night, out. Monday, we will discuss it with you. So, Terry from JP says, the only chain I demonstrate for is JP Licks. Best ice cream there is. That's exactly the kind of thing we are looking for. You and I both. So, you went to school in California. I don't think they existed then. Yeah. But I went to California most recently. Well, not most recently. A couple of times ago. In-N-Out. I'd never had In-N-Out yeah. burgers. 
about as good a fast food burger as I've ever had in my well, they, life. But we don't secrets. have any out here, do they we? They have secret things with the In-N-Out burgers, right? Yeah, you animal. These, the, yeah, the special burgers. Animal with, style, like, I think. It's called on animal style, like yes. Jim, I, you know what? I, I really, the reason I wanted to do this segment is because I wanted to play an ad because I've never been to this restaurant. Which? Uh, well, it's a place that has one of the catchiest uh, titles ever for what in their called? ads. It's called Floramos Restaurant. I think it's gone, isn't it? Is no, Floramos gone? No, one in oh, Chelsea not, oops, sorry, gone, sorry, sorry. But there's still one in Malden, so I'll be very disappointed if this ever goes out of business because I will no longer be able to hear this. Come into Floramos Restaurant in Chelsea today where the meat falls off the bone. Meat falls off I the bone. I love that. Now, really we have good. a regular person saying the same thing with a strong Boston accent here. Floramos, where the meat falls off the bone. What are you on the payroll? What do you care? I love those ads. Don't you love those ads? Chelsea is like three miles from here. Don't you get in you your car to go, and go I've to ne- Florama. I've never been there. So you're missing the whole concept. You know something? What? They didn't sound as good as they used to sound. Maybe well, that's why they had this close one in Chelsea. Maybe it think. is. Well, you're eating less meat, you know, so maybe that's the. Uh, well, thing if I was going to eat the meat, I would want the meat that fell off the bone. You would. I would. Absolutely. I love meat. You know, the beauty, we have never talked enough about this. The slow cooker is considered the low rent cooking utensil uh, in the cooking world. Mm-hmm. If you cook almost any meat in a slow cooker, you know what happens? It's, it's, it falls off the bone. falls off the bone. Thank you. We don't have much time, but we're going to take Eileen from Plymouth. What would you go 100 miles to picket or protest about to get in your community? Go ahead. Trader Joe's. And there's not one near you? Well... Yeah, yeah, but not that close. Not it's close like enough. Miles. And what is it about Trader yeah, Joe's that really good. does it for you there, Eileen? Well, they have really good prices, and they have healthy food, and they have a lot of really healthy frozen food. They do. Which is very useful. But I have to then pay for the gas to get there. That's a very good point. So, uh, well, that, so you'd protest, you'd go the 100 miles, do what you had to do to get a Trader Joe's near you. You get the concept. Thank you very much for the call. An anonymous texter says, Boston needs, I never even heard of this, a Buffalo Wild Wings, but I am not going to demonstrate. And another anonymous texter said, my wife would travel and protest for life alive. I have one at the end What's of my street. Life alive? I'm not a vegetarian. It's a vegetarian restaurant, and it is cheap, it is affordable, and it is fabulous. Isn't there one on Boylston Street right down here? I think we're you know, something. I think it's, there's one on Berkeley. I'm Berkeley reading this Boston, story about sure. Arby's roast beef, and they say that although the roast beef is real, it's processed to the point that it becomes something distinct. It comes inside a plastic pouch, mm-hmm. which is superheated until Super-heated. the milk is cooked through and then sliced after being well, you removed know, from the yeah, package. I know it doesn't sound great, but you know what's on the other? Oh, it's on Commonwealth Ave. My apologies. You know what the other thing is? Uh, what's my point? Oh. Curly that, fries? No, that Arby's, which I don't know if I've ever had Arby's actually, is considered one of the healthiest, I think everything is relative, fast foods. Did you know that? I did not know that. Well, you know it now. Okay. Let's go to Harry in Providence. What would you do? Well, you know what I'm talking about. What would you do? Uh, uh, what would you do it for, Harry? Hello. Well, I just based on blanked out. Um, there was a restaurant, they, uh, the, the buffet restaurant. It's a, uh, I remember home, hometown buffet. Yeah. Oh, home country buffet. Home I mean, country. If they yeah. ever had something like that out here, that would have been great. Yeah. Wait a minute. Hold I have on. to say, home it's country buffet. The no, RMV. they used to have it in Watertown at the RMV. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Harry. It was like it was sort of like a, a an order of boiled water in my estimation. <laughs> You, but it's not called home country. It's called our what's country it called? buffet. Country buffet. A country buffet. So you don't have one of those. You know what you do have in Providence? What's the name of that all-you-can-eat thing that costs like two hundred dollars? We can only stay for ninety minutes. Oh yeah, but Neptune it's not, it's or not, something. It's not in Providence. No, but it's in Rhode Island. Yeah, Same thing. It's I, a I little tiny state. It, but it's a place you, you can spend stay there for two nine, hours. Nine, right. Because football teams come in on a bus and yeah, they got to get them out of there. That's right. They have lobster, prime rib, the whole thing. Uh, thank you for your. Uh, uh, call there. Do you want to take another call? There's a Buffalo Wild Wings and Seekonk in Texas. Really? Says. Yeah. She's, and she says, I've never set a foot in there and never would. Now, it's called the Nordic. Thank you. In the Charleston, Nordic. Rhode Island. Thank you. And someone just texted, and I oh. am totally with this person. They would drive 56 miles to get to Magoni's. <laughs> now, unfortunately, Magoni's, <laughs> Magoni's is, is no longer with us. You know us. why it's closed? Because you trashed it. I didn't trash it at all. I would never trashed it. But you know what? It. They're renovating it. They're going they to put are? a roof deck on it. Is that really true? Nice. Oh, listen to this. What's that? I would travel 50 miles to get a concert venue that features a duet with Tom Rush <laughs> and Marjorie Egan because the show's <laughs> range from fine, fine to, not, to not, bad. not bad. Exactly. Well, you could be singing because how hard is it to be a folk singer? You just 
pick up the guitar and you start saying something. Okay. I, I think that call, that tech, whatever they are, is totally right. Okay. Well, Marjorie, the good news is we're totally out of time. We're out of time. Okay. Oh, Thompson's Clan Bar in Harwich Boy. I, I would do that too. I would do that. Thompson's Clan Bar in Harwich. Yeah. Everybody asked for Thompson's Clan Bar in Harwich. No, I do actually. I'm not yes. going to sing it because you no, made fun not. of me. But that no, because Tom Rush could sing it though. It's kind of one of those brain worms. Not great, but good enough. Yeah. He's a great singer. He's a great singer. And he's very cute. And by the way, if you didn't hear the first half of the show, Marjorie didn't just say it by mistake once. She said it like 11 times. <laughs> so it was very intentional. Tom, if you're still listening, I'm sorry I didn't to tell say it you about it. Times. No, 10 times. I said it twice. You said it as many times as the guy last night said my predecessor. Let's leave it at that <laughs> and we can go home. Okay, we are Bye. done. Bye, we're done. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to another edition of Boston Public Radio. Thank you. Thank you. You can keep up with this 24 I have a culture show sticker. Do you have a sticker from the culture show? We don't have any stickers. I don't have any stickers. No, we don't. Tune in Monday. We're going to be joined by Diane Foley. She is the mother of the murder journalist James Foley and has a new book detailing her family's struggles and the legacy of her son. She's going to be here with the Ground Truth Project's Charlie Sennett, plus NYU medical ethicist Art Kaplan, conservative Bill Crystal from the Bulwark. Oh, great. I didn't know that. wait to talk to him. Yeah, he's one of the Republicans that is standing up against Donald Trump. The Reverend Irene Monroe and Emma G. Price III will join us as well as Boston Globe film critic Odie Henderson oh, for great. an Oscars recap. Great. A really good show, Jim. Really good show. And, of course, Jim's classic, but very old, very old, moldy chestnut, Daylight Saving Time. And we'll hear all about the little children with their miners' hats. I want to thank our Sunday crew. night, it's happening, my friend. Zoe Matthews. It's lighter in the evening. I'm happy about that. Oh, Aiden good. Conley, Nicole Garcia, Hannah Loss. Additional support from Ethan Kotler. Our engineer is John the Claw Parker. And our executive producer is Jane Bologna. Special thanks to the team here at the Boston Public Library. Matthew Glover, Maddie Geyer, J Josh Polonsky, <coughs> excuse me, Sandra Lopez-Burke, Carly Cochran, and Isabella Karen. Stay tuned to The Culture Show, which is going to start here right after the 2 o'clock news. Uh, you are listening to Boston Public Radio for the next couple of seconds. I'm Marjorie Egan. I'm Jim Browdy. The Culture Show is next. Have Please a wonderful stay weekend. Tuned. Hope you have a great stay weekend. Stay tuned. Bye.
Library. The Culture Show is made possible in part by a generous contribution from the Fiducia Fund, proud to support this station's art and culture programming. Boston residents are people of color, but the city remains starkly segregated. Systematic racial inequality has a long history in the city. From GBH News, I'm Soraya Wintersmith, host of What is Owed, a new podcast exploring what it looks like for one of America's oldest cities to figure out its reparations debt. Do you have thoughts to share about this issue? We'd love to hear from you. Call or text your comments to 617-958-6061. Support for our programs comes from you. And Krakow Witkin Gallery, presenting a solo exhibition of Kiki Smith's new sculptures, drawings, and prints, including an eight-foot-tall wood engraving of the moon. Visitors can explore this and other contemporary art at krakowwitkingallery.com. And Celebrity Series of Boston. Mox Rob and Palast Orchestra bring swing and cabaret big band classics from Germany's Roaring Twenties and Tin Pan Alley at Symphony Hall on March 19th. More at celebrityseries.org. President Biden is having a tough time convincing people that he is taking care of the economy. The State of the Union was a chance to rebuild that confidence. It's less about saying, look at these six giant bills we passed, and more about finding very concrete examples of where that lowered somebody's costs in their household. Did he get that message across? We will discuss on All Things Considered from NPR News. Today at 4, here on GBH News 89.7. Welcome to The Culture Show, broadcasting live from our GBH studio at the Boston Public Library. I'm Jared Bowen with co-hosts Callie Crossley and Edgar B. Horwick III. If you're just tuning in, it's our Arts and Culture Week in Review. RuPaul is sending a rainbow bus across the country to give away books that have been targeted in book bans, but there's already a book backlash. Let's just leave it there. So we'll talk about part one, which was part one is this was really interesting earlier this week when RuPaul came out. Uh, and what you can probably surmise is also a bit of publicity because he has his new memoir coming out, but he announced that he's going to form a, basically this book enterprise along with two other people, Eric Servini, who's a Pulitzer Prize nominated author, and Adam Powell, who's an actor and drag performer. The goal being that they can get more books out about representation and give uh, a greater portion of those proceeds to the authors, a better deal than they get from major publishing houses. Banned books. Banned books, books, exactly. Uh And that these will be books, or even the books that they publish, that the authors are sending out. uh, And that they can then take this rainbow bus and and take banned books into the south in places like Birmingham, Tallahassee, and Baton Rouge and give away some 10,000 books. Here's a little bit of RuPaul talking about this on TikTok, announcing the new bookstore element of this. Okay, y'all. I told you I have a big announcement. Well, here it goes. I have co-founded an online bookstore called Allstora. And honey, it is a blast. We are moving the conversation forward. Allstora is supporting authors. It is supporting you. All voices everywhere. So that's part one. So let's discuss this chapter, and then we'll discuss chapter two, which ostensibly this was an extraordinary effort that RuPaul and the other two, Eric Servini and Adam Powell, were making. Well, it's part of what I think is an innovative pushback movement against the book bans. They've been going on now for, what what would we say, six years, seven years, in in earnest. Um, And a lot of the communities that he's targeted to stop where where the bus would stop have had books taken away from libraries. We're talking about school libraries and public libraries, which I will point out, public libraries for everyone, not just people who are upset about one or two books. And the important thing to know that in these bans, that the targets are against content material and authors who are writing LGBTQ uh, content and uh, uh, BIPOC 
authors and BIPOC content. Those are, you know, uh, people of color who are writing books and the content that they describe in those books. That's the primary targets. So I say that this is actually a battle for young readers and teen readers specifically. The adults are in this, but um, a, a lot of these kids would not have access to any of this kind of material if it's taken off the shelves as it has been. So here he is with this bus uh, in the latest innovative way to do it and just giving out, you know, 10,000 books. And I manage there will replenish and go back again uh, when that's done. I mean, you, it's, it's fabulous. And you know, when we look at the online marketplace that they were setting up yeah. as, a, as a part of this, I, I don't think you can undersell the idea that I, I really applaud the effort to try to return more, a higher percentage of the money to the authors of these mm -hmm. books, right? You know, one of the promises of the internet early on, if you know, those of us who are old enough to remember when the internet was just getting started, mm -hmm. you know, there was this promise of like, man, everybody's going to have access to it. Everybody's going to have a voice. If you're like something like an author or a band, you can just like make your music and put it out into the world, right? But what we've seen as this has matured is that if you're an author, it's basically Amazon. Mm -hmm. And if you're a musician, places like Spotify have not really held up their end of the bargain in terms of you could have millions of people listening to your music, but you're not making any money on it. So I really applaud the effort for them to kind of put this marketplace up together and say like th one of the central goals here, in addition to making sure that we're spotlighting, you know, diverse authors, that they're saying we're going to try to figure out a business model. We're returning more money to the author. So thumbs up to that part of it. And uh, I think one other thing to, to be clear. RuPaul, for people who do not know, 16th season of RuPaul's Drag Race, yeah. an international phenomenon. The man has made billions of dollars at this point, so his it, cultural impact is huge. Yeah. But turn the page, yes. Yes. and the rest yeah. of this is people began to examine this new book-selling structure and realized that RuPaul and his co-owners of this business are basically using a book distribution structure that others rely on, which means books that you don't want to see on shelves like Mein Kampf and anti-LGBTQ plus racist books are part of this structure. They didn't do their due diligence yes. to figure that out before they launched this project. So of course now there has been an epic backlash. And to some degree they got back on it and they said that they they don't want to restrict speech, which is kind of an odd thing when you're talking about Mein Kampf, and that 100% of the proceeds of those books will go to helping these LGBTQ plus causes, other causes. Uh, but this was clearly not through, and now this has become a big mess for cleanup. And why? I don't understand. I mean, when you're starting, see, the two partners, uh, the two guys that he partnered with, had a shop called Queer Company before. So they were already in the business of doing some of the book stuff. They sold other products. So I, when you know what your mission is, and what your mission is is to ferret out this other stuff and to support what would be on the rainbow bus, then the most important thing that you would do would be to pay attention to what's coming in the space. Am I wrong? No, <laughs> I, I mean, from a business standpoint, absolutely. From a, from a philosophical standpoint, though, you, you, you sort of ask the question. I mean, I, like they, you know, they, in the statement that, they've, that they have on the website, they're basically, to your point, Jared, they're saying, look, we, on the one hand, we're, ma like, we're on, we're on so we have one position on where we're at in the world, but we're putting a bus together that we're going to take to places that are restricting access to books. So it's also tricky for them to go, okay, we're going to restrict access to books oh, on no, no, our no, no, website. No, 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 I'm going to disagree with you because yeah. they're not restricting. This is your space. Uh, I agree. In which you have a, a very st a well-stated mission. You, if you feel the need, you can point people to other places for which they could purchase it, but why am I supporting what, what I thought was your yep. mission um, on the backs of some stuff that does nothing but undermine uh, the very identity of who I say I am? Am I wrong? No. I, <laughs> okay. No, and that's why this feels like a rushed business enterprise. And exactly. this is where, frankly, it feels too much of a PR plan, a, a PR marketing plan. Uh, yes, my book is coming out, and so not only is the book coming out, but we're going to have this great effort, again, without doing due diligence. So, again, there's going to be a lot of cleanup, and it's a shame because it, the effort w was extremely well-intentioned, and now it's kind of been, it has not kind of been, it's been very much sidelined by the criticism here. Right. Well, another big story that surfaced this week was Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, who died 
died a number of years ago, about a decade ago, had one final novel, and he did not want that novel to be pu published. However, his sons have decided that they want to go forth, and they have reviewed the manuscript, and they have assembled notes that their father wrote, they have assembled different versions of this final novel that their father wrote, and they have decided to publish it. As we were talking this week, we thought this would be a great discussion on The Culture Show, because this is not the first time that there has been a question about posthumously publishing somebody's work. The, this same question arose with Virgil's The Aeneid. Yeah. Uh, we saw, we wouldn't have the girl, with the, girl, the girl with the Dragon Tattoo unless Stieg Larsson's novels had been published posthumously. Ernest Hemingway didn't want his novel to be, his last novel, True at First Light, to be published. So it raises the question, when do you respect an artist's wishes or when maybe for the betterment of the arts in general, do you put their work into the public sphere? Okay, so my question is, when do you decide not to be greedy? That's what this is about. <laughs> now, come on, this is the bottom line of you greed. the sons? Yes, the sons. This is the last work that they have. They themselves have said there's nothing else in the drawer, and we know it looks like we're trying to be greedy. No, you are being greedy. Here's how you can make certain that, that last, uh, those last pieces of work that were not done, that he said he didn't want, even if he had dementia, as that they're now blaming it on dementia, where he didn't really mean it because he had dementia, leave it where it was, which is in the archive. So therefore scholars, students, anybody else could go and say, let's take a look at that work, compare it to the other work that he has, talk about it in the context, and maybe we all ponder what he meant by the notes and the scratch outs or whatever. It was not left to you to publish this after the man said, don't do it, or, unless you're trying to make another dollar. Or the other place you can do, <laughs> put it, is in the fireplace like Henry James did and just well, burn it so then it really never happens. Yes. Yeah, but, that, you know, but you, what you were saying at the top though, Jared, is, is, is you know, you kind of go, like Kafka asked for all of his stuff to be burned and how many of us went to, uh, in high school or in college, studied The Trial, for example, which is a fantastic work, which he wanted to be burned. He asked for that to be burned. I think these are all, these are all like so tricky and there's never a one size fits all for these circumstances. Um, you well, know, this one seems a little. But I don't know. I mean, it's. It, it, I have to say, I'm with you. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you <laughs> off. No, but it's I'm okay, with you, Edgar. But it's just this we feels weren't there, different. right? And 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 it sounds like he went back and forth about whether or not like he wanted this published. He definitely read excerpts of it at one point. I think the part other of it thing, was published in the New Yorker and yeah. in a Spanish newspaper. But I think the other thing here is, um, I, I think we shouldn't lose sight of like what makes great works of art great works of art, especially works of literature, right? You mentioned Ernest Hemingway. I think about something like uh, A Farewell to Arms, mm -hmm. which went through 39 revisions, right, by Ernest Hemingway, and then back and forth with the editor to get it right. So the truth of the matter is anything that doesn't get finished by the artist themselves is never fully that artist's work. And I think that and like... so, therefore... So, I, I, I'm not saying it shouldn't go out, but like... it. it, it you know, people say things like, well, it's going to, it's, their legacy will be tarnished by the fact this, that this went out. But will it? I Harper think Lee. Most, <laughs> but I think yeah. most... Oh, she was still alive. For, yeah, yeah. I, I just, I don't know that that's a tarnishment on their legacy. I think, like, if, if it comes out, the people who don't care aren't going to care. The people who do care, like scholars or like people who are fans, are going to understand that this was not a fully finished work. So, yeah, I have to oh say, no. Edgar, I kind of came down on, on your side because I, I was thinking of Harper Lee, who, again, she was still alive when this you know, quote unquote discovery was made of a piece after To Kill a Mockingbird and it was published. I made the decision not to buy it, not to read it because I had heard how horrible it was. It just sounded like a money grab, as you were saying. So, to your point, Edgar, I could choose to participate or to not participate and hold dear that one novel of hers that I really liked. I, I have to say, I was also thinking of a conversation I once had with Nancy Shern. She's the sculptor who did the Make Way for Duckling statues just down the street from us mm -hmm. at the Boston Public Garden. And she made the point that once the work leaves her studio, I know we're talking about sculpture yes. and we're also talking about books here, but once the work leaves her studio, and maybe that's the key point here, it left yeah. her studio, it didn't in this other Thank case, <laughs> that it is then for the audience to interact with it and to interpret it and do what they want with it. And to some degree, I think there is a case to be made because he had trotted this out publicly, because he had read some of it publicly, because he had 
uh, purchased uh, because he had published some of it, that maybe it does belong in the public realm. We know the context, at least in this generation, so we can choose whether or not to take it or not. Other authors have also weighed in, or at least one other author, and said that he really valued the work. So I do feel differently for this one, but it, great, it raises a really terrific debate. All of that said, he put it back in the drawer. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, okay. Karen, I'm 100% with you that in most of these cases, there is an element of greed. If there was no money on the line, I think it'd be, it'd be, it'd be happening a lot differently. <laughs> All right, well, we are going to uh, follow up for our, we're calling this follow up Friday by, <laughs> by heading back into the courtroom uh, because we realize that often we talk about stories and other media talk about stories. We never actually go back and circle back and give you updates, but three big stories we talked about recently do have uh, an update to them. Edgar, why don't we start with you? So I, I don't know if folks have been following. We talked about a couple weeks ago, this Hotel California trial. Basically, the, the deal was that uh, all of these legal legal pads, these yellow legal pads on which a bunch of lyrics from Hotel California and other songs from that record uh, had ended up in the, in the hands of this author who sold them on to some people who deal with selling and buying of these things. Don Henley's legal pads. It, they were You're Don right, Henley's. Yes, right. And Don Henley, you know, a few years ago went, hey, wait a minute, those are my legal pads. I never gave them away. They're essentially stolen and now people are trying to sell them. I want them back. He, you know, sued these, these folks for being involved in this. Uh, what happened this week, and so it, this went to trial, everybody was like, is Don, is, you know, is Don Henley gonna like testify? That was like a big deal. He did, uh, and then abruptly, sort of out of nowhere, this case gets dismissed this week. Turns out that there was a whole bunch of back and forth between Don Henley and his lawyer, a whole bunch of stuff that was not under attorney-client privilege, that sort of comes into everybody, and the prosecutors look at this and they said, "Well, that's pretty damaging. Like, actually, I don't, <laughs> I don't know that that uh, we have a case anymore." So, case dismissed. And basically, like, what has happened here is what I thought from the start, which is essentially like I didn't think any of these people really remembered the '70s and like what happened. <laughs> I mean, you think about what the Eagles were doing in the 1970s. Sort of seems like that's what's happened here. So, no criminal trial. Although they have said that potentially they may pursue something in the uh, in the civil in the civil in the civil courts, but yeah. I think probably not. I think that's dead. <laughs> yeah, I think it's done. Yeah, I think right. it's done. We're moving on to Cali for your update for us. Right, so we've been talking about Taylor Swift and Beyonce's concert films and their huge impact, certainly with audiences, live audiences. Hey, but AMC theaters really got a boon when both of them elected to put those concert films in the theaters. So $1.1 billion more in the fourth quarter of 2023 compared to about $99 million the year before. Before, at a time that theaters are still, movie theaters are still struggling, coming back from COVID, trying to draw people back. Uh, you know, the head of AMC is over the moon. Um, and this, they did all this, they subtracted all the expenses, the depreciation, all that kind of stuff. Um, and they came out way on top. So he said it outgrossed all of what was offered theatrically last quarter by competitors such as Paramount Pictures, Sony Pictures, and Lionsgate. I mean, that is immense. He wants to do more, needless to say. Yeah. <laughs> I would. Um, I just, uh, this is amazing. One other little side note here. We've talked about how there were two reporters assigned, to specifically both to Taylor Swift and Beyonce. I just want to note that none of these stories seem to be coming from them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, on the pages of USA Today. Uh, yeah, you oh, know. Interesting. Yeah, I'm just saying. Well, and this also ties back to the very yeah. first topic we talked about. Oh, surprise. <laughs> When you feature people of color, women? Yeah, exactly. It's like, right. who's big on the screen? <laughs> Beyonce. Seems like people want to see that woman do what she does. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So there you go. Well, my update is about Rust. We've been talking about that trial, too. And, and that was a trial where Hannah Gutierrez read the armorer on that, what seems like a very fraught set, independent set for the filming of Rust, where... Alec Baldwin either did or didn't fire a gun that ultimately uh, killed one woman and left another person injured. Uh, but that armorer was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter this week, not guilty of evidence tampering this week. It was a very sort of sordid t t uh, trial that where people had said that there was an accidental discharge the day before, there were drugs on the set, uh, that it was very problematic. So this all points now to Alec Baldwin, who is up for the next trial. He had had charges brought against him. Those were dismissed, but then the prosecutors went back 
still not completely clear why and what they had in a new investigation that they could bring more evidence to a grand jury to figure out whether they could indict him. Turns out the grand jury figured out they could. So he now faces trial on January 8th, and it'll be the same kind of charges against him in voluntary manslaughter where he could face 18 months in prison. Uh, he has argued that he didn't fire the gun, that he had only pulled back the hammer. So that's the next phase of this. We'll see what happens this summer. Uh, but So one more trial to go. But it, based on this, of course, juries can be very different, but right. it doesn't look very good for Alec Baldwin, especially what we know about the set and, and how the jury deter determined guilt here, uh, just whether it was intention or not, of course, in voluntary manslaughter. Yeah, this is really a sad story. I'm All right. Well, coming up on how a soaking wet Colin Firth's scene stealer in Pride and Prejudice was anything but a steal, that's next on The Culture Show, live from our GBH studio at the Boston Public Library. Massachusetts is facing increasingly urgent challenges, from housing to immigration to tightening budgets. I'm State House reporter Katie Lannon. This week on Talking Politics, we sit down with Governor Maura Healey to discuss how her administration plans to address them. Plus, an early look at a bill moving through the legislature that aims to place limits on the length of shelter stays. Join me for Talking Politics tonight at 7 on GBH2. Support for GBH comes from you and Comcast Business, committed to keeping businesses up and running with Comcast Business Internet, with internet speeds up to 10 gigs available. Comcast Business, powering possibilities. And Q Legal, providing legal marketing solutions for law firms in Boston and beyond. Marketing strategies include websites, social media, video, and search. You can learn more about their services at qlegal.com. It's been 10 years since a Malaysia Airlines flight went missing over the Indian Ocean. Families of loved ones on board are still trying to understand what happened. We kissed him goodbye, said we love you, and that's where it stopped. Seeking answers about missing flight MH370, that's next time on The World. This afternoon at 3, here on GBH News 89.7. Welcome back to The Culture Show, broadcasting live from our GBH studio at the Boston Public Library. If you're just tuning in, co-hosts Callie Crossley and Edgar B. Herwick III are here for our Arts and Culture Week in Review. Now, the last time we saw Tony Soprano alive, he was sitting in a red diner booth. Uh, I went ahead and ordered a show for the table. Nope, and that wasn't our technical problem either. <laughs> For all we know, he could still be sitting there because that's how the series ended very, very abruptly, sitting in that red diner booth, which went up for auction this week, and it did quite well, didn't it, Edgar? Not too bad. They decided to do this on eBay, uh, and that, I think, turned out to be a good move. Was it $82,000 that 82, it went for? 82, yep. 82 plus thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, good job by that diner. Well done. Very smart. Um, it's awesome. Like stuff, stuff from stuff from TV and movies. We want it. You know, I don't have eighty-two thousand six hundred dollars, <laughs> but that's something I actually would like to have. Would you? <laughs> yeah, you would. I, yeah. With the whole, I want. And then would, the, you, yeah. would you eat at it? Would uh, you? You know, be? yeah. Have people come sit at it? We, uh, you know, yeah. we have popcorn. Look at the. See, that's why I yeah. wouldn't want it because a lot of people <laughs> well, have sat true. in that because this is actually <laughs> from a real <laughs> yes. ice cream place. Yeah, yeah. that's true. And, and this is kind of a sweet story. The family wanted yeah. to renovate and to have the money for the renovation, which I think they needed about sixty thousand. Mm -hmm. They decided to auction off the booth, and yeah, so now they have money plus. But a lot of people still go to that place and sit in that booth to and have the Sopranos experience. I think people experience. will still go to that place, right? Because right? it's yeah. the place that happened, right. and then you'll, you know, you'll just say, "Well, we changed it," right. and, and now somebody has the booth. Presumably, somebody willing to spend eighty-two thousand dollars on it is going to take <laughs> care of it. Yeah. So that's great. So Kelly, you said you didn't have eighty-two thousand six hundred dollars, no. but <laughs> but did you have the twenty thousand plus pounds to buy Colin Firth's shirt from Pride and Prejudice? I do not. But, you know, I know why someone would buy it. <laughs> they thought it was going to be seven 
1,000 pounds, or, uh, but it went for more than that because this is the scene when Colin Firth playing Mr. Darcy comes out of the lake and he, uh, uh, Elizabeth Bennet doesn't know that he's on the property, it's his property. And at this point, she's come to realize she's prejudiced against him wrongly. And it's a fraught scene because the words are so simple, but underneath the subtext is so rich. Miss Darcy, Mr. Bennett, <laughs> I thought you were away, sir. No, I came back yesterday. <laughs> I mean, these are really Callie, a can sweet moments. Can I ask a question? Is yes. it the subtext or is it that the shirt eventually gets well, wet while Colin Firth well, is wearing it? Well, it was a little it. sticky to his body, and I got to say... Little column A, little column yeah, B? she was okay. getting over her prejudice faster in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that very now dry white linen shirt that was once very wet went for also a good cause. This went to a charity, which was uh, very, very lovely. So your chance to own memorabilia this week. <laughs> So this is our, we just got played off the last segment so that yeah. we could spend just a couple of minutes talking about the Oscars. And uh, this is one of those years where it seems, of course, the Oscars are on Sunday night, where we kind of know everything that's going to happen. I think maybe with two exceptions, the best actor category will likely either be Killian Murphy from Oppenheimer or maybe Paul Giamatti from the locally shot The Holdovers. And the same with the best actress category, likely Lily Gladstone from Killers of the Flower Moon, but possibly Emma Stone from Poor things. Edgar, what are you looking forward to in the Oscars? Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of with you. Like, I, I, I love the Oscars as uh, as like a television show. Like, I actually like the actual production. I love, I do, I admit, you know, although even for my taste, the amount of red carpet coverage that is out there is a little bit sort of above and beyond, but I do, I love seeing people come. Uh, I love seeing them arrive. Of course, you always, you're expecting like the folks who are there, who are nominated in that particular year, but unless you were like really like looking and being careful about who the presenters are, there's always some surprises. You're like, oh, you're really excited those people are there. They're also, I'm really excited. They're doing a, a thing that they did, I think about 15 years ago for all of the uh, actor um, categories in that the presenters are gonna be five different folks who have won it. that category before to do the present or won acting categories before to do the presenting. That was very that. popular 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. They're bringing it back, so I'm stoked about that for the broadcast. So that, I mean, you know, I'm just, it's a great thing. Put I it know. on on Sunday, watch it, I'm in. Uh, well, our hometown favorite, 20 Days in Maripol from Frontline is up and is uh, declared many, by many people to be the winner of the documentary feature category. That was my category years ago, first African-American in that category nominated. Um, and so the fun thing is, wait, thank you. Uh, walking on the red carpet is fun, going in the ladies room even more fun, but they did change some rules that I think that Rainey talked about the other day that is interesting, Rainey being executive director of uh, Frontline, that now now, when the category is called, they're going to have everybody in it move close so they don't have so long to walk to the stage to accept. But if you don't win, they walk you back <laughs> to your seat. A real walk of right. shame. So it was hard enough to be in the seat in, in the old days like we were and watch that camera move away from you and realize <laughs> you did not win. So no, wait a minute. <laughs> Kelly, just, just to underscore so yes. people understand, when you say like in the old days like when we were there, just <laughs> Explain you. Yes, I was nominated for an Oscar for a, in the no. documentary feature category. Yes. <laughs> Barry in the lead there, Callie. Yeah. Yes. Come on so now. So that was hard. When that camera walked away, I was like, and the only other point I will make is that everybody told us we were the top winner and we didn't get it. So, you know, things can change at the last minute, I know, from a heartbreak standpoint. What are you <laughs> looking forward to, Well, Jerry? I was just thinking about doing the walk of shame. It's bad enough to do the walk of lost shame, but they'd have to do it by Brad Pitt and Meryl Streep. Yeah, like passing everybody. <laughs> just yeah. horrifying. But no, actually, I was excited about the same thing, that we'll, we're, we'll see this big, wide, vast roster of big Hollywood stars who are returning for the, the major Best Actor Awards. And yes, our fingers are crossed that we're going to have a very good Monday morning here at GBH for yeah. Frontline Likely Winning for 28 Days in Mariupol, this fabulous documentary uh, that they have produced. Our fingers are crossed. That is the sign that it's time for our lightning round. These are the headlines that caught our attention this week. Hallie, what caught yours? 
Oh, well, a sad story. Uh, Style Maven, Iris Apfel, that's German for Apple, passed away at 102. People may recognize or remember her for the big owl glasses and all of the bangles and the just, um, I love the the uh, title of the, of the magazine piece about her in tribute by Elle magazine. Too much was never enough. I feel her. I'm wearing the bangles. This is from the Iris Apfel collection. <laughs> I'm hey. wearing the glasses. All right. I mean, she was fabulous. She loved textures. She loved a lot of mixing of combinations of things. She called it jazz, and she loved jazz itself, but she said that that's how she dressed and, 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 and created her own style was improvisation. And she became a uh, model at 97 when IMG signed her up uh, and had many, many years of walking down run runways, and people loved her. She was fabulous. She was fabulous. I will just <laughs> add that I interviewed her once, and she was so lovely. So cool. And I was going back to my interview this morning to, to look at it. She had so many great quotes, my favorite. I put the rest of them on my Instagram page if you want to look at it. But I asked her, you know, there's that whole adage, before you leave the house, take one thing off. Right. Hers was, <laughs> keep adding. Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> so I asked her about that, and she said, but you've got to know when to stop. I asked her, how do you know when to stop? She said, when I can't bear to hold my neck up. <laughs> That's a very good strategy. Maximalist. I know. I know. Maximalist. Edgar, what caught your attention? Well, what caught my attention was the Dune popcorn bucket. Have we seen this? Have we seen the Dune yes. popcorn bucket? I mean, this is an app. I, I love when somebody seems to lose their mind and like who, the folks behind this seem to have lost their mind. I mean, this is... Uh, so if you haven't seen this, this is a sort of gimmick... Uh, around the movie Dune, which have these sandworms, and the popcorn <laughs> bucket has like this kind of rubber sandworm head that you have to reach through to get your popcorn. Uh, here's a, a quote describing it from a New York Times article, which I think is good. When I first encountered an image of the popcorn bucket, I stared at it for a beat, trying to process what I was looking at. It was intricately designed, but appears, well, especially anatomical, to put it politely, <laughs> and somewhat difficult to use to actually get the treats into your mouth. Uh, Denis Villeneuve, who's the, uh, who's the uh, director of the movie, when he saw it, he said, holy smokes, what the bee? <laughs> <laughs> Then he said he respects a bold choice, but there's been an SNL sketch and amazing <laughs> not safe for work memes. You want to go down a wormhole on the internet this week? That's a good one to do. It's uh, absolutely insane. I love it. Well, my lightning round pick uh, comes from our local beloved band, New Kids on the Block, mm. who announced this week that they're coming out with their first album in 11 years. It's called Still Kids. It'll be out May 17th. This is their eighth album. Uh, and as they described it, it's all about hope and possibility. And I thought <laughs> there is wow. no better time for New Kids <laughs> yeah. on the Block album because we all want to go back 20, 25, 30 years, however far we have to go back to Hanging just... They're hanging tough. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and so we can all like hang in there, hang right. by a thread, as you yes, <laughs> often yeah, say, Kelly. Yes, yeah. um, but it just seems joyous. They seem really excited about it. They're, of course, embarking on a tour also with Paula Abdul and uh, DJ, DJ Jazzy, Jazzy Jeff, Jeff, who will be on the album, as will Taylor Dane. Oh, oh, wow. So some wow. great partnerships. And who wow. knew? Donnie Wahlberg wrote, uh, co-wrote seven of the songs. I wow. Know that. And Joey Get it, McIntyre Donnie. Okay. wrote All some right. of them, too. Wow. Hmm. So that is what caught our attention. <laughs> Well, that is all for this edition of The Culture Show. You can catch up on all things arts and culture by way of our podcasts, which you can find on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Callie, before we go, what's coming up on Under the Radar this weekend? We're diving into the 10 Million Names Project, which is a really fantastic national deep dive into identifying by their real names, the 10 million enslaved men, women, and children. It's a fascinating story about how it came to be and how it, op how it is operational. And we have all of the main uh, folks who are involved with that. Second part of the story uh, show is about uh, a new arts-focused tour called Bori Corridor, which is based on the Broequan, Puerto Rican art mm. and culture, and it's traveling around in the corridor of the Northeast where there are uh, big Puerto Rican populations traveling with indigenous Puerto Rican artists. So and love a portmanteau. Great. Very yes, good. Yeah. Go. Smoosh those words together. <laughs> and Edgar, how about the Curiosity Desk? Uh, we recently, uh, you can check it out uh, on Morning Edition, took a 
deep dive into the uh, alternatives to daylight saving time. So there's a lot of stuff actually out there in legislatures, including here in Massachusetts, about changing how we do it. We look at the pros and cons of some of the most popular plans that are out there, which include uh, staying on standard time, always staying on daylight saving time, and perhaps moving to Atlantic time for us here, which mm -hmm. is the next time zone over. So there's pros and cons to all of it. We talk about it. And then coming up on the Culture Show on Monday, We'll have the story behind collecting the oral histories from people who attended Woodstock. By the, so they're doing this great oral history project. They are coming here to the Boston area. So if you went to Woodstock, oh. if you can remember going to Woodstock, <laughs> they want to hear from you in these very lengthy interviews they're doing. And they're making great discoveries mm. about people's experiences at Woodstock. Well, thank you today to the BPL technical and logistics crew, Glenn Heath, Cy Patel, Josh Polanski, Maddie Geyer, <laughs> Matthew Glover, Eddie Hickey, Sandra Lopez-Burke, Isabella Karen, Carly Corcoran, and thanks to the Lennox Hotel and right here to the Newsfeed Cafe. We really appreciate you. Yes. We will be back here every single Friday broadcasting from the Boston Public Library. I am Jared Bowen. Have an art and culture-filled weekend. <laughs> You're not going to like it, George. Where is she? She's an old maid. She never married. Where's Mary? Where is she? she Where is she? She's just about to close up the library! The Culture Show is made possible in part by a generous contribution from the Fiducia Fund, proud to support this station's arts and culture programming. Spend your afternoon with us. Stay with us for GBH's All Things Considered at 4 and Marketplace at 6. But first, the world. A global view of today's headlines from the World Newsroom right here on GBH 89.7. Funding for our programs comes from you. And Comcast, offering the Xfinity 10G network. Designed to provide a connection for home networks so everyone can be online at once. Even during peak hours. Xfinity.com. High School Quiz Show is celebrating 15 years of sharp minds, devoted fans, and big wins. Join new host Joe Hansen for another exciting year as the new season of High School Quiz Show continues tomorrow at 6 on GBH2. Get ready for Books and Brews, a night of pints and conversation with best-selling author Hank Phillippe Ryan. Join GBH at Widowmaker Tap Room and Kitchen in Brighton, where Ryan will discuss her latest thriller, One Wrong Word. Bring your burning questions, for there'll be a chance to chat in person with the author. It's all happening on Tuesday, March 19th at 7 p.m. Tickets are free, but registration is required. Learn more and reserve your tickets now at gbh.org slash events. I'm Jim Browning. And I'm Marjorie Egan. And you and I are listening to 89.7 WGBH HD1 Boston. Online at gbhnews.org.